Tonight, the greatest ever goes in search of the ultimate two-wheeled ride. A motorcycle is a machine for making you feel good. They're the most basic form of transport, but uh, they just happen to be the best fun you can have on the road. To earn the right to be the greatest ever motorcycle, the bikes will be pushed to the limit. We'll ride them hands-free. We're gonna race a jet fighter. And we're gonna try and destroy them. A motorcycle is an extension of one's ego. A motorcycle is an extension of one's penis. A motorcycle is an extension of one's spirit to, to literally fly. After you've ridden a, a 500 Grand Prix bike or, or motor GP bike for that perfect lap, there's nothing else that can uh, that I have ever witnessed that comes close to that. To find the greatest ever motorcycle, we've got the greatest panel of bike experts, like Jay Leno, who'll show us around his personal museum. Why does anybody like bikes? You're either attracted to it or not. It's a bit like uh, all of a sudden you're attracted to girls. Well, what is it about the girl? Well, there's certain parts of it you find intriguing. Some people call it an obsession, some people call it an addiction. Some people just call it the greatest thing in the world. Now sit back and hold on as you're about to discover the ultimate ride. Starting our countdown is a bike that symbolizes rebellion. It's well on. It's the Harley Davidson Knucklehead. Knucklehead, that sounds like a lot of work. The Knucklehead has probably the highest sex appeal factor on the Richter scale. Well, there's no doubt, if that bike hadn't existed, Harley wouldn't exist today. Launched in 1936, it wasn't until after victory in the Second World War when servicemen returned from the battlefield and were looking for some wild peacetime excitement that this Harley legend was born. It's like being able to buy a hot rod. You know, it was, it was, it was the fastest bike of its time in America. The Knucklehead's twin V-aligned cylinders doubled the engine's brake horsepower. While previous Harleys could do 65 miles an hour, the Knucklehead's 1,000cc V-twin could do 100. Even so, it wasn't fast enough. Everyone wants their bike to be kind of quicker and better than the next guys, so people really started heavily modifying their machines. And it, to start off with, it was all about stripping them down to their essence. They chopped bits off to make the bikes lighter and faster and rechristened them choppers. It was an expression of bucking the rules. And from that point on, people who rode motorcycles were the bad people. Being a bad boy was really liberating. It created an image that continues to this day. So this is my 1945 knucklehead chopper. The engine is what makes the knucklehead a knucklehead. The uh, heads here, this is why they call it a knucklehead. Supposedly, it looks like these knuckles on a fist, right here, just like that. This knuckle, of course, isn't stock. It's chopped, or what we'd say, chopper. It's uh, you, you take off all the unnecessary equipment, and you customize it so that it's your own. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. We have a chrome Springer front end. Stock, of course, was black. This is a 21-inch uh, front wheel with a modern disc brake. Small headlight here. These, what they call dog bones, to bring the handlebars up into baby apes. I think it makes the riding configuration more comfortable where you're up here. It vibrates, it roars, it, uh, it hugs the road. It's part of you, and it's part of history. The idea was you sort of got on the road. There were big, big wide seats, as you can see, comfortable, softly sprung. Because in America, especially in the Midwest, it was 200 miles dead straight. It's kind of agricultural, but you do it with a big grin on your face. You know, it's a fantastic thing. 60 years on, and the Knucklehead's legacy is still alive in all modern Harley V-twin engines. But a whole new type of rider has taken to the road. Why do I ride a Harley? You know, I like Harleys, and I like my Harley friends, but I love the person that I turn into. And the person I turn into is one that's just completely saturated with all my senses. Sight, I see the unblocked, unobstructed views of this God-given country. 
sound. Of course, I hear that beautiful American legendary rolling thunder. But the most important is the taste. And you go, what do you taste when you ride a Harley? I taste the Spirit of God. Every time I'm on that motorcycle, I thank Him for the freedom and the ability to cruise on my V-twin. When you look at a modern Harley now, and you look at a knucklehead next to it, you can see it, the, the two are kind of absolutely genetically related. There's a really close DNA between them. All Harleys share a unique sound, but even this fantastic rumble originates from the knuckleheads V-twin. They make this roar, kind of like a thunder. It's in your ears, it's in your head, it's in your blood. And it's a, it's a roar, kind of like you're on a wild beast. And as you ride, it talks to you. It goes, I'm feeling good, I'm feeling good, I'm feeling good, I'm feeling good, I'm feeling good. Potato, 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 potato. And the more you crank the gas, the faster it gets. The more sound comes out of it, louder and louder. But just how unique is this rumble? Well, the greatest ever is going to find out. And we're going to test to see if Harley-Davidson really does have that unique rolling thunder. One of these bikes is a Harley, but can Angie recognize it from its sound? Here we go. First up, a Honda Shadow 750cc. <laughs> I'm positive that is not a Harley. Next, a whopping 1100cc cruiser. <laughs> That's not a Harley. And last of all, it's our Harley Davidson. That's my Harley. Did I get it right? Yes. Yeah! Woo! The knucklehead, I love it because it was the great, 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 great grandfather of what you see on the roads now. It's an eye catcher. I'd say it's a classic looking, beautiful Harley. It's a rolling art. Rolling art it may be, but it's the bad boy image that sells Harley Davidson motorcycles today. So you get the dentists, you get the lawyers who are in their office from Monday to Friday. Saturday, they iron on the tattoos, they put on the false beards, and they go chugging around on a Harley Davidson. The knucklehead's pure motorcycling emotion. It's just about riding, whereas the modern one's about being seen on it somehow. It's, it's, it doesn't have the purity of a knucklehead. The knucklehead is certainly a classic, but for turning this symbol of freedom into an executive toy, this Harley gets 10th place. Coming up, nine more fantastic bikes, including the most audacious race bike ever built. It seems like a crazy attempt to reach for the stars. And the bike that put Italy back on the road. It's the sound of Italy. It's the sound of Rome and Milan. As we search for the greatest ever motorcycle. In our search to find the greatest ever motorcycle, the Harley-Davidson Knucklehead claimed the number 10 slot. And at number 9 is the most daring motorcycle ever built. It's the 1955 Motor Guzzi V8 race bike. <sighs> Motor Guzzi. The Guzzi is just an incredible machine. You know, it, it's multi-cylinder technology at a time when no one else was doing it. It seems like a crazy attempt to reach for the stars. It's just the perfect combination of genius and madness. So why is this bike so great? Well, it all comes down to the engine. The V8 was, was genius, but kind of genius and insanity mixed up in one. It was a huge leap forward. It was like, why carry on doing what we're doing now, producing single cylinder machines? Let's just leap forward in, in one fell swoop, 20 years, and let's build a V8. In an engine, the more cylinders you have, the more power you get. But it also increases the size, and a V8 is huge, which is why it was only ever put on cars. I like the most complicated possible way to do the simplest task. That always seems to intrigue me. And the Moto Guzzi V8 is the most complicated way to do the, the, the simplest task. To build a V8 small enough to fit on a bike, Moto Guzzi had to quarter the size of all the components. The whole thing weighed just 45 kilograms. The genius of this design is not so much in daring to make an eight-cylinder engine, but in packaging it so tightly that it became usable as a motorcycle engine. The V8 engine was a bit of a jewel. 
everything was so small in it compared to other engines of the time. It was a real work of art. And when you look at one of those Guzzi V8s all apart, it's, it's like taking a, a watch apart, little tiny pieces. Racing is always about going fast, but the 50s were pretty special from that point of view. The, the, the Guzzi V8 did almost 190 miles an hour, and, and it was another 30 years before Grand Prix bikes had got back up to that speed. But technical problems such as engine seizures plagued the Guzzi V8. Costs spiralled, and sadly it was scrapped in 1958, just three years after its conception. It was ahead of its time. If, if metal technology had been greater at that time, the V8 probably would have been a world championship winning motorcycle, but it was just, it was too much technology for the time, I think. 50 years later, you think they were making a V8 Grand Prix bike back then. It's just fantastic. Of course, it could be said that genius which succeeds is genius, and genius which fails is madness. But that can only be said in retrospect. Although the Gutsy V8 is the most audacious statement in racing, ultimately it was a failure, so it gets ninth place. Our next bike put Italy back on wheels and is today the ultimate fashion accessory. In eighth place, it's the Vespa. The Vespa is just a buzzy, buzzy little thing. It's a sort of a bike, isn't it? And the Vespa is one of those elements of chemistry where engineering and art kind of flow together in just the right combination. It's the sound of Italy, it's the sound of Rome and Milan. When you ride a Vespa, you're not just riding a, a cheap, efficient mode of transport, you're riding something which has so much style and history. Even its name is stylish. Vespa is the Italian for wasp and was given to the bike because it looked just like one. The Italians are very good at design and then their designs are rooted, in, I think, in, in sensuality. It's all rounded, the rounded edges. It's not a threatening machine. It's a kind of a warm and cozy, fuzzy machine. The entire thinking behind the Vespa wasn't motorcycle thinking, which is why it's such a success, because it didn't sell to motorcyclists. It sold to people that had to ride a two-wheeler, not wanted to ride a two-wheeler. Italy had been flattened during the Second World War, and so Piaggio, an aircraft manufacturer, came up with the Vespa as an innovative answer to the need for basic transport. The Vespa was a brilliant improvisation using things which Piaggio already had or could easily produce. For example, the wheels of the original prototype were aircraft tail wheels. The simple two-stroke engine uh, was a starting unit for large aircraft engines, and the structure Pressed sheet metal. The Vespa is, is fascinating because it wasn't designed to be uh, a motorcycle as such. It was designed by an aeronautics engineer who actually hated motorcycles. So all the negative aspects of motorcycles as he perceived them were ironed out of the Vespa. So there was no oily chains, there was no exposed engines. You didn't have to dress up in motorcycle clothing. You could ride it totally normally. It was just really easy to ride. Women could ride it. People rode it to work. It was just a doddle. Decent suspension, it could be ridden over bad roads. Really nice little thing. But it wasn't its magnificent robustness and handling that made it popular. It was because it was cool. Celebrities wanted to be photographed on them. Pop stars wanted to be photographed on them. Piaggio understood about marketing. He just made it the symbol of the scooter. You didn't say a scooter, you said a Vespa. It's meant so much to so many people. After the Second World War, it got Italy back on the road. Then it became the, the choice of uh, the mods in Britain, became a huge cult machine. And, and now it's back to being what it first was. It's a utilitarian vehicle. I love my Vespa because she gets me around everywhere in London. I've always wanted a Vespa. I always to see them parked around in um, scooter bays and things, and I always think, God, look how beautiful they look. They're just so streamlined. They've got a beautiful shape. They're just so cute. Look at the back of a Vespa, and it's got a really cute butt. I don't know. I just love it. Scooters are still around. Scooters are still the perfect way of getting around town, and the Vespa was the first. 
Just a genius invention. The Vespa is undoubtedly the king of the city runarounds, but with wheels no bigger than dinner plates, this bike is out of its league on the highway, and so for that, it's placed eighth. But number seven is a machine which outperformed everything. One of the most desirable and exclusive motorcycles of all time. It's the Bruff Superior. The Bruff Superior stood for speed and luxury in an age when it was pretty difficult to get either out of a motorcycle. In its time, it could achieve levels of performance that were denied to any other machine. It's 1924, and it's a bike that's guaranteed to do 100 miles an hour. I mean, that's just madness, isn't it? This is my uh, 1934 SS100 Bruff Superior. It's the uh, fastest uh, road bike company ever produced. In an age when the average car could only do 42 miles an hour, the SS100's JAP engine could get up to 110. It was the ultimate in performance and luxury. The Bruff Superior is known as the Rolls Royce of motorcycles, following a road test in, I think, 1923, when the tester likened it to a Rolls Royce. Uh, George Bruff uh, used this in his advertising. Rolls-Royce got a bit miffed at this, so they said, we're coming out to the factory to see you. So George had everybody put on white coats and gloves and, who, you know, just go around. And so when Rolls-Royce came, oh, they were so impressed that, you know, these guys were dressed as gentlemen and, oh, such care. And... Rolls-Royce were so bowled over by what they saw that from then on, the Bruff Superior had their seal of approval. George Bruff that made it was a bit of a showman. He would do anything for publicity, really. I think George was a bit like uh, P.T. Barnum was in America. And like you say, you break a record, then you make sure everybody knows that you've broken that record. And even people not interested will now know. But that's what makes them fun. There's such a mystique about them. There's all these sort of sexy stories. And of course, Lawrence of Arabia had seven of them. And uh, he would write letters to the factory, and George would publish those letters. And, uh, and he would talk about the speed, and he raced the biplane. And, you know, and if you're a schoolboy at the time, well, this was just... You know, legend. For anyone wanting the thrill of speed, the SS100 couldn't be beaten. But traveling at 100 miles an hour was a precarious feat. The problem of early motorcycles in the 1920s was called Speedman's Wobble. A Speedman was a motorcyclist who liked to go fast. The wobble was caused by the front wheel becoming unstable, but Bruff had an ingenious answer for this. The uh, machine has castle forks, which are of the leading link design which means that the, um, the wheel spindle is carried ahead of the main fork member. Uh, this means that uh, it's a very stable design. If you hit uh, a bump, then uh, you're less likely to get into a speed wobble. The Bruff, because of its castle fork and its stout chassis construction, was stiff enough to reach high speeds without developing speedman's wobble. In 1925, George Bruff demonstrated the stability of his new SS100 model by having his road tester ride the machine at about 90 miles an hour and then remove his hands from the handlebars. This feat hasn't been repeated in 80 years, so the greatest ever is going to attempt to do it again and ride a Bruff Superior hands-free at 90 miles an hour. This is the big one. There we are accelerating now. Up to 75. Up to 80, into top. We're reaching 90 miles an hour. We're at 90 miles an hour now. And the hands are off. A bit of a crosswind, but it's pretty stable. 95 we're doing now. Hands off. Absolutely no problem whatsoever. George Ruff may have uh, been a bit of a bullshitter, but he certainly wasn't bullshitting about the stability of the SS100. Absolutely no problems. What a machine. It was not hype. It was true. The motorcycle did stand up to all the advertising. It was an exceptional motorcycle that did, that did exceptional things all well. The Bruff Superior was this astonishing quality product. It was really expensive, but it was beautifully made, and it was incredibly fast. You kind of got what you paid for with the Bruff Superior. In its day, the SS100 cost £170, when most people earn just £3 a week. 
and so was only ever ridden by an exclusive few. For that reason alone, it gets seventh place. And at number six is a truly unique race bike. It's fast, furious, and built by one man. It's John Britton's V1000. John Britton was a man obsessed. The Britain is just two fingers up to the whole motorcycle industry. Everyone that's ever got their hands dirty working on a bike has dreamt of making one. They've dreamt about creating a motorbike, and John Britton actually did it. In the early 1990s, John Britton, an engineering genius from New Zealand, stunned the world with a race bike that he built in his garage. The Britain is a unique machine because it, it just shouldn't have ever happened, really. In the 1990s, it should not really have been possible for one man to take on whole factories and defeat them. The V1000 won repeatedly through its racing career. It did this not with the fastest engine, but because it was the best designed bike on the track. There's a lot of room left in motorcycle development. It's not, not even begun to stop. And I think that he was one of the guys that saw something different and was actually able to transfer that to a living beast. Remarkably, Britain built the V1000 from scratch and constructed every piece of it himself. John Britton looked at the whole bike from top to bottom. He didn't just take one element. He, he really looked at the whole thing and said, how can we do this differently? Is there a better way of doing it? To make the bike faster, he had to make it lighter. But the problem is this can make the bike weaker. Britain had a simple solution. He threw away everything that wasn't necessary. And if he could make one component do two jobs, he did. So the engine unit has got the back suspension bolted onto the back of it and the front suspension bolted onto the front of it. And effectively, the frame doesn't exist. There is no frame. But Britain's most innovative idea was to use carbon fibre to build most of the bike's components, just as strong as conventional materials, but less than half the weight. So you're always looking to make a motorcycle better. You're always trying to anticipate what it wants so you can go faster. So you're always looking for the, the last split of a second. The V1000 weighed just 145 kilograms. That's 25% less than its nearest rival. But to make the bike even faster, Britain redesigned its suspension. The dominant form of motorcycle suspension to this day is the telescopic fork. However, telescopic fork involves sliding friction. It's not a smooth motion, it's a jerky motion. John decided to substitute for the telescopic fork this girder type fork, which uses rotary motion rather than sliding motion. The circular motion of the girder fork is much smoother and meant the V1000 could corner faster. The results were startling. Ferociously fast and extremely well handling. It just, it just left everybody else in the dust. The V1000 raced against the greatest bikes in the world and beat them. It's the most successful independent racing bike on the planet. He made a bike that was clever, beautiful, and really fast. It may not be the best motorcycle on the racetrack, but it's his interpretation of what the best motorcycle should be. It kicked ass. It's the greatest motorcycle because it kicked the ass of the big guys. It's a, such a romantic story. That's what I love about it. It's just this idea that one man can make a motorbike and it can win. But the V1000 has a tragic end. John Britton passed away after a short illness just three years after building the bike, and the revolutionary technology died with him. It's our sixth greatest ever motorcycle. We're halfway through our countdown, and so far we've had bikes that epitomize luxury and speed. But still to come, the coolest bike on the planet. It was kind of like bare naked sex in a rough and rumble American way. And the motorcycle that takes riding to the max. It's frightening to drive, but then again, it's sort of exhilarating. You just kind of go, ah, oh, I'm still alive. As we search for the greatest ever motorcycle. So far in our top 10 greatest ever motorcycles, we've had romance, sex, and speed. With another five bikes to go before we find out which is the ultimate ride, what could top that? Well, how about a bike that has all three? A British motorcycle that became an icon on both sides of the Atlantic. It is the Triumph Bonneville. Triumph was the quintessential British motorcycle. 
And in the 50s, the company was made the coolest thing on earth when, when Marlon Brando rode a Triumph in the wild one. He didn't ride a Harley, he rode a Triumph. For this British export, Brando was key to selling it successfully in the USA. When Marlon Brando rode into the Wild One riding a Triumph, it set a new standard for being a bad boy. They were the coolest bikes in America. It was kind of like bare naked sex in a rough and rumble American way. The Bonneville was the kind of bike that every young thrusting male wanted because it was performance personified. And it was performance that gave the bike its name. You call a motorcycle the Bonneville, it's all about speed. A modified and streamlined Triumph set a new land speed record of 214 miles per hour at Bonneville, Utah. It was the fastest bike in the best range of bikes that were on the market. It was light, it was powerful, it handled well. It, it was the ultimate go-fast motorcycle back in those days. I remember when you went into the Triumph dealer, all Triumph Bonnevilles had that, that sticker on the gas tank that said, for the expert rider only. When of course, when you're 14 and never even sat on a motorcycle, well, that's the one you have to have because obviously you're an expert, it will soon be. The Bonneville 650cc twin cylinder engine provides loads of power, but with two large pistons moving up and down at the same time, it has a major downside, vibration. This is my 1970 Triumph Bonneville. I'm gonna start it up so you can see the vibration. What you can see here is the front wheel is dancing as due to the vibration. Also, look at the instruments, they're all wiggling, and as is everything on the whole motorcycle is vibrating. And it gives you the feeling of power. You know that there's real horsepower there uh, as you're accelerating, and, and the vibration, of course, continues as you accelerate. They did vibrate, and uh... Uh, women seem to enjoy them a bit more, so, oh, oh, we have a Triumph. Yes, I'll ride on the back of that, sure, sure. As much as power was at the heart of the Bonneville, it was its sheer beauty that sold it. It was a motorcycle that created desire. You desired one. It's sexy, it's cool, it's fast, it's, it's just the perfect balance of what a motorbike should be. This bike, as you see it, I think, was about as perfect as it got. In, in styling, in looks, in, in paint. Uh, there's nothing on the bike that doesn't have to be there, with the exception of the, I used to call this the castrator, this lovely luggage tray here. When you'd have the accident, you, a certain part of you would hook onto this, and, and you'd use these. So then you're, and then, then you're back to riding Vespas after that. The Bonneville defined high performance on two wheels for 10 years, but without any investment. In 1969, Honda stole its crown and Triumph was forced into bankruptcy, so it only gets fifth place. The bike at number four takes riding to the max. Probably the most controversial motorcycle on the list. It's the exceptional Y2K. Well, this is a... Uh... Really a stupid motorcycle. The Y2K motorcycle raises the question, why? The Y2K has got as much relevance to motorcycling as a fish. To me, the Y2K isn't about motorcycling. It's, a, it's an exercise in technological masturbation. Steady, guys. This bike has a specification that makes grown men weep. This is the Y2K turbine superbike. It's powered by a Rolls-Royce gas turbine engine, producing over 320 horsepower. This little engine is capable of over 400 foot-pounds of torque at 2,000 RPM. The bike weighs essentially 500 pounds, dry. It will hold eight U.S. gallons of diesel, kerosene, Jet A. Quite literally anything that'll burn, this motorcycle will run on it. Its incredible jet engine is taken straight out of a helicopter and means the Y2K can travel at 250 miles an hour. It doesn't make any sense at all. It's, and it's one of those things you can only run in America. In England, you'd be in prison. You'd be in prison within minutes of having this stupid thing on the road. Jay's owned a bike almost four years now, and he's quite literally our test pilot.
When we talk about distinctive sounds that motorcycles make, you know what you can hear a Harley Davidson. You can you can tell a Ducati that's coming. But the Y2K makes a, a sound signature uh, unlike anything else on wheels. And you feel like there's an F-16 landing in your backyard, but it's Jay on his Y2K. Well, it's a great fun to ride. It's a bit like flying a jet plane, but uh, on land. I mean, you open the throttle and you hear and then you feel this tremendous fire as a turbine. And it's like, it's frightening to drive. It, but it, then again, it's sort of exhilarating. You just kind of go, ah, oh, I'm still alive. Why would you put a jet helicopter engine in a motorcycle frame and try to pilot it down the street? And the answer is, because we can. I mean, this was meant to lift a Bell Ranger helicopter with six guys in it and full of equipment. You know, what does that weigh? 5,000 pounds? This is 450 pounds, so power rate, power to weight ratio. Do the math! At 250 miles an hour, the Y2K holds the Guinness World Record as the fastest production bike ever made. It's also the most expensive. Well, the motorcycle's at $185,000 on for the faint of heart, but obviously you have to be able to stroke the check to have this kind of a sensation in your life. And I guess if you could bottle and sell, it'd be the most addictive drug in the world. And uh, this is the kind of drug I want to be addicted to. I'll show you something cool on this. Look at the rear tail light. But behind this gimmick lies a serious story built on experience. And I was sitting at a traffic light one day, and there was a uh, Nissan Infiniti, you know. And I could see the guy easing up to look at the bike, and I kept trying to go forward, and he kept easing up. And I realized I couldn't go anymore. I'd be in traffic. And you've got 1,200 degrees coming out of this exhaust. And I look back, and I see his front bumper start to go because it's plastic. It just smells like this, you know. So I'm like, oh, gee. I might pull away. <laughs> I don't think he probably noticed till he got home. It might do 250 miles an hour, but what's the point of doing 250 miles an hour if, if you can't really go around corners? It's, it's not a complete motorcycle. It's a, it's a kind of a bit of a gimmick, I suppose. Gimmick or not, the greatest ever is about to find out. We've set up an experiment to test the sheer power of the Y2K's acceleration at Acadiana Military Airport, Louisiana. The Y2K turbine superbike is about to go head to head with an L39 jet fighter. From a standing start, the bike hopes to beat the low flying jet over a mile long course. Certainly, uh, I'm nervous. Uh, the rider is obviously the guy that's got this rocket between his legs. We've got a uh, special stunt rider here, and uh, James Kane has agreed to ride the bike. I'm confident that we've got the horsepower and the torque to get the job done. As the plane makes its final descent, Ted gives the stunt rider some last minute instructions. Oh, we're gonna beat the planes, no doubt. It's just how bad now. I told him to let it all hang out. Don't hold anything back. The jet is flying at 170 miles an hour. The bike will go when the plane is just 50 meters behind it. It's a test of pure acceleration. like it's a close finish, so Ted has to wait for the official result. The back one, the back one. No way! Yeah. All right. Woo. Thanks, guys. The Y2K accelerated to an incredible 217 miles per hour in 14 seconds and beat the jet by just two bike lengths. I think it's one of the greatest motorcycles because someone said, Let's stick a jet motor and a motor and two wheels. I mean, that's pushing the envelope. The Y2K doesn't do it for me at all. I think it's just a guy with a small dick trying to prove something. Most of us didn't have the opportunity to become a jet pilot and fly F-14s and Top Gun. This is Top Gun. It really does scare you half to death, but it's it's great fun. I think it's they should get the points for just doing what no one else would have 
thought wise to do in the first place. Top Gun or not, the experts' decisions are split, and for that, the Y2K is stuck at number four. Our third greatest motorcycle is one of the most pivotal bikes ever made. It changed the way all bikes were designed. It's the Honda CB750. This was the ultimate motorcycle of its time. The CB750 was the world's first ever superbike. It came out in 1969 and just blew everything else away. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. 1969 was the year of the first moon landing, and, and the Honda CB750 came out in the same year, which was fairly fitting, really, because it was light years ahead of the competition. The competition were the British bikes, especially the Bonneville, but they now looked antiquated in comparison to the Space Age CB750. When I was 21, I had walked into a, a local dealership. The dealer was kind enough to let me test ride a 750 Honda. I took it out through the streets of Hollywood, running along at about 100 miles an hour, not that I condone speeding, and uh, came back to the dealer, uh, and first thing I asked is, how do I buy one? Who do I have to kill to get this bike? Here was a bike that could do naught to 60 in seven and a half seconds, and had such high quality engineering, it could run for over 100,000 miles trouble free. It was the first time a bike had been so durable and reliable. It was a production motorcycle that outperformed virtually everything that was before it and uh, it changed the way uh, motorcycling in general is designed. This state-of-the-art engineering included the first ever disc brakes on a production bike. These are extremely reliable and meant the CB750 could stop much faster than its British rivals. On top of this was the revolutionary inline four-cylinder engine. Four-cylinders were like Ferraris. They were extremely expensive motorcycles, limited production, uh, parts were not available. Then suddenly Honda comes along with this and a disc brake. I mean, disc brakes were for airplanes. Even most American cars did not have disc brakes at the time. This is my 1970 750 Honda. I've had it for many, many years now. I'm going to start it up for you. I want you to take a listen to this. Close your eyes and pretend this is a Ferrari. Even now, most high capacity motorcycles you see on the street are inline fours, just like the CB750. That's like 35 years on. The inline four, with its two pairs of counterbalance pistons, took the real glory. Developed in Grand Prix racing, this removed the vibration that had limited the engine capacities of all previous bikes. It meant steady power, even at high speed. One of the tests that the dealers, uh, salesmen, tried to show was that they would balance a glass of water on the seat and rev the motor and show that it still stays there. Uh, it just so happens I have a glass of water right behind me. Let's try that test. Pretty amazing. Certainly could do that on any bike made prior 69 or any other model. I'm impressed. I didn't realize it was that smooth. <laughs> I guess it does work. <laughs> the CB750 certainly made it that you didn't have to suffer to go fast. Until then, if you wanted to go fast, you had to put up with vibration, you had to put up with unreliability, you had to put up with oil leaks, you had to put up with bikes that perhaps didn't stop very well, fell apart around you. It just made it really easy. Sadly, this outstanding performance and reliability does come with one major disadvantage. This is going to sound odd, but riding the CB750 is actually a little boring because it's too smooth and it does everything a little too well. I guess British and Italian bikes are about emotion and Harleys are about emotion, whereas the Honda wasn't. It was, it was a much more clinical bike. It ticked all the boxes. It performed and it stopped and it went around corners and it looked good, but it's just a bit boring. The CB750's groundbreaking performance and reliability ultimately made it a dull ride, and for that, it gets third place. 
But at number two is a bike that will give you the ride of your life. From its extraordinary looks to its phenomenal performance, it is the Ducati 916. The 916 is sex. The 916 has got it all. What makes the Ducati exceptional is the fact that it looks amazing and it was this beautiful looking package, but it also was phenomenally successful on the racetrack. The Ducati 916 started its life as a production sports bike, but became a race icon when it won three consecutive world championship titles. It's basically a racer on the road, but it's much more than that. What Ducati did was introduce seriously beautiful design to a high performance motorcycle like no one had ever done before them. They really thought about the aesthetics of the thing. It was a completely fresh styling job. Uh, they moved this, the exhaust under the seat. They put this fairing on with these really distinctive headlights in. It was just this wonderful package that was really slim and everything fitted together beautifully. In making it dense, small, and simple, they achieved a kind of beauty that can't be achieved in any other way. It's evolutionary. But it was the engine that made it a world champion motorcycle. When it came out, all the Japanese factories were racing around on four-cylinder machines, but the Ducati brought things back. It came out with a V-twin engine, which might not have had quite as much power as the inline fours, but it was the way it produced the power. A four-cylinder engine delivers high power at high revs, which is great for straightaway speed, but anyone who's been to a racetrack know that races are one accelerating out of corners, and this is where Ducati's V-Twin excelled. How do you make it accelerate when you're on the side of the motorcycle is, is something that's very, very difficult to do. When the motorcycle is leaned over, in a turn, its two little footprints of its rather small tires don't have a lot of grip. In order to begin accelerating early in the turn, the engine has to develop smooth and very controllable power right from the beginning. It can't come in with a sudden rush because it will simply break loose the tire. The machine will either slide out or actually fall over. If you don't have that power pulse, you're not going to be able to do all them things you want to do. So you're going to wait, uh, what, five meters in each corner, which means you're going to get uh, 15th uh, instead of first. Ducati's 90-degree V-twin engine was developed for the specific task of accelerating smoothly off of corners. You get a lot more traction. You can feel the rear tire a lot more closely so that you can accelerate much harder because you really can feel what's going on at the back of the bike. Ducati's ability to deliver power in that way, won world championships. A big wheelie imminent to take the checker flag. It is Carl Fogarty then. He's the man in charge of the World Superbikes 1995. The 916 dominated World Superbike like no bike has done, winning a record 13 of the 17 constructors' titles it competed in, and sales of the road version thrust Ducati from a small-time company into a world heavyweight sports bike manufacturer. The 916 is one of the great bikes because it redefined sports bike design in the 1990s. Not only did it look great, it also performed really well, and, and it reintroduced the V-Twin as a serious, high-performance engine configuration. It epitomizes Italian styling excellence, engineering excellence, and competition success in a single machine. It's this perfect combination of sound, racing success, and fantastic riding experience. Oh, and it looks brilliant too. For its space age design and incredible power delivery, the Ducati 916 is the second greatest ever motorcycle. What a machine. We've counted down nine incredible bikes in our top 10 search to find the greatest ever motorcycle. But which one gets first place? We're about to find out. In search of the greatest ever motorcycle, we've gone through nine incredible bikes that combine performance with romance, styling with sex, great bikes, but none as revolutionary as our number one machine. It's been in production for almost 50 years and has put whole nations on the road. The greatest motorcycle ever is the Honda Cub. The Honda Cub is the bike that made Honda. 
It was just a motorcycle that, that took over America. Honda Curb has to be number one because it's the biggest selling bike of all time. You can't argue with that. With more than 40 million Cubs built, that's more than the entire population of Canada. What Sashiro Honda wanted to do when he designed the Cub was, was to have a, an incredibly simple machine that would have huge mass appeal. The engine in the Honda Cub is not more complicated than the engine in a lawnmower. Although it's got just four brake horsepower, it can pull 50 miles an hour with its one-cylinder air-cooled engine and three-speed automatic gearbox. You don't get much simpler than that. It's sort of what got motorcycle people started because you could go down and buy it and it ran forever. It was a get on and go vehicle. And this was the key to Honda's tremendous success marketing his products in the United States. In the 50s, motorcycling had such a bad reputation. If you were a biker, you were either a rocker or a hell's angel. In order to sell the Cub, Honda had to appeal to a new type of rider, ordinary people. Anybody could ride one. Your parents wouldn't get mad at you. In fact, your parents wanted to ride that motorcycle when they saw it. The world was hooked, and it wasn't long before the Cub went global. This is the amazing new Honda Super Cub with a unique four-stroke engine to zip you up hills, give you up to 221 miles per gallon, and speeds up to 40 miles per hour. Everyone's ridden one. It's like a universal experience. Everyone's ridden a Honda Cub. You know, everyone from Bangkok to Birmingham. The Cub was built to be abused. This isn't the kind of machine that you're meant to lavish love and care on. These things are designed to be driven into the ground. It doesn't matter what the Cub faces, it seems to keep running. So the greatest ever is going to put it to the test. And who better to help us than Charlie Borman, who, with actor Ewan McGregor, pushed his bike to oblivion around the world. OK, uh, today we're going to try and destroy a Cub 90. And I've been told that you can drain the oil and put any old oil in it. Can I take a tub of some old cooking oil? Well, stupidly, what I've done is I've, I've uh, left a nut inside here. <laughs> so now I'm going to have to fiddle around for the oh, nut. I'm going to put this chip oil in there. It's pretty rank stuff. It's almost a Formula One oil change, that. I would say, you know, you shouldn't try this at home, OK? There we go. There's no smoke out the back, so it should be OK. We'll stick, we'll just have a quick drive around the block and see what, uh, what happens. OK. The chip oil seems to be fine. We've been driving around a little bit on it. And you can still bounce off corners. Oh, oh, I could almost say that it was running better on this oil. So the Cub handles just as well on chip fat as engine oil. On to stage two. Hiya, can I take 80 pizzas, please? The Cub weighs just over 50 kilograms, so Charlie's next challenge is to overload it until it carries four times that. There's not enough weight with the pizzas, so we're going to... Uh, I want to buy some more fruit and get as much on as possible. <laughs> Look, that's the old sort of... <laughs> oh. oh, it's top-heavy. All this fruit and pizzas weigh 200 kilograms, the equivalent of a small family. <laughs> Well, not as conclusive as we'd hoped, so time to try something more drastic. You can shoot one and it'll keep on running. You can crash them, you'll, the handlebars will bend and all that kind of stuff, the bodywork will bend, but it'll still keep running. They were bulletproof. I mean, as far as the motors and stuff went, they were, they were pretty good. Well, we've tried taking the oil out and filling it up with this uh, horrible greasy fat from that, from that pizza place. We've tried loading it up so that it can barely move with too much weight, and it still goes. So now we're going to chuck it off a building and uh, see if it goes after that. The bike is going to fall 22 metres to the ground. 
Surely that should kill it. Here we go! <laughs> that looks all right, actually. Although the wheels are dented, but, but it looks all right. The bike was travelling at 54 miles an hour when it hit the ground. There's surely no way it can still work. Let's see if we can get it moving. Oh, I think it's buggered, really. Anyway, we'll see. Let's, let's get it started, see if we can start it. And we'll see what happens there. OK. Ah. <laughs> you see the indicator. <laughs> so it's working. Let's get it in gear. <laughs> well, it's still going ish. At least it went forward, and uh, so effectively the bike is won, and uh, they are indestructible. It's a uh, you know testimony to the bike. If you're seeking to destroy a Honda Cub, if you have sufficient amounts of C4 explosives, you'll probably be successful. Other than that, you got no chance of knocking one down. They'll just keep coming. It's like Dirty Harry. The Honda Cub helped build an automotive empire. Still going strong after 47 years. It's cheap, simple, exciting to ride, and definitely indestructible. It is the greatest ever motorcycle. They are the ultimate toys for grown-up boys. It's purpose designed just to have fun. Built to appeal to the rebel in all of us. It is a very, very special sensation of courting death. It's as simple as that. Most cars are made for getting where you're going. Sports cars are about the thrill of the journey. It's outrageous, it's passionate, it's emotional. Can I say it's better than sex? Through the years, there have been some gems, but which one deserves the title, greatest ever? To help us narrow it down to 10, we asked the world's top drivers, collectors, critics and enthusiasts what they thought. Our experts looked at performance and pedigree, style and technical innovation, and along the way showed us what makes a truly great car. Britain's favourite aristocrat will put the James Bond car through its paces. Actor Steve McQueen's son, Chad, takes his famous father's wheels out for a curtain call, and we'll find out why he's using simple garage tools to explain some revolutionary technology. We're also going to try and get Ferrari's latest supercar to triple the speed limit on a Louisiana interstate. So brace yourself for a red-hot ride as we count down the greatest ever sports cars. We begin our greatest ever countdown at number 10 with a car whose name literally says it all. The legend has it that when the designer first brought it out to the factory, one of the workers, he said, he said, Kuntash, which means, wow, my god, incredible. The Lamborghini Countach was an outrageously, deliberately provocative, sexy car. You looked at it and went, wow. I mean, it was quite uh, jaw-dropping. A Countach is you know, every teenage boy's wet dream of a sports car. The Countach qualifies for our list because it broke new ground for sports cars. It looked like nothing else that had ever come before it. It was a very dramatic car. I mean, it was angular and it was all sort of carved out of a piece of rock and then put on the road and low down. And it was supposed to stop you short and say, that's different, which it was. The reason it looked the way it did was the Formula One technology that made its way into the car. Pirelli designed the tires for the car uh, that were extremely wide. I mean, they're, they're one of the largest uh, tires that were ever put on a production car. In fact, that's the secret to this car. 
Because the tires were almost double the normal size, the body had to be built around them, helping to give the Kuntash its outrageous shape. The Space Age doors were real head turners, but they are more about styling than engineering. The car's chassis was extremely rigid, and that meant the body didn't bend or flex much in the corners. With no need to compensate for a flexing body, the suspension could be set up very tightly, just like a race car, keeping the Kuntash level through turns at high speed. It's designed uh, for ultimate performance in mind. Only three were produced each week, which meant the waiting list to get one was a year. It also came with a price tag of $150,000, inspiring the phrase supercar. Supercars is a name given to a car that goes above a certain speed, i.e. sort of somewhere um, between here and Mars, and will go faster than anyone needs to go. Um, so we're talking 150 plus, certainly in the mid-70s. But the Kuntash was more than just the fastest sports car of its day. Just like Farrah Fawcett, it was also a pinup, one that ended up in teenage boys' bedrooms all over the world. Uh, including mine. I just dreamed of having one. Eventually, after a two-year search, I found one in Alberta, Canada. And I found out, fortuitously, that this particular car was the actual car that was in uh, the poster that I had as a kid. It was from that period in the 70s where the big hairstyles were in, um, the padded shoulders, girls looking sort of big and brazen in Hollywood, and the car looks a bit like that. It's, it's Italian, it's kind of, but it's busty, sexy, glamorous. To drive, I would have to say it was thrilling but not relaxing. It was not a great long distance car. The noise level was very intense. It was one of those cars that you could say one of the best moments of your life is the first hour you drive a Countach, and, but the second hour is one of the worst experiences of your life. Because you've got no rear vision. You can't see what you're doing most of the time. Bad visibility while driving forward was one problem, but with a tiny rear window, reversing was even trickier. You know, the Lamborghini factory taught people how to back the car up, and you actually have to put the door up crawl out and sit on the sill with one foot on the gas and one hand on the wheel and then look over your shoulder. She had to hang out of the car to drive it. It's silly, but uh, for the for the 15 year old boy in you, it's absolutely fantastic. But what seems fun to a teenage boy was definitely not for everyone's tastes. It's a car, you know, you take from your house around and then come back to your house and wasn't meant to be reversed. Like many things that got our attention in the 70s and 80s, the Countach doesn't necessarily stand the test of time. For a lot of people, this car is downright ugly. It was, it was a cross between Star Trek and something your, the hairdresser would really want to travel around in. So when you look in a Countach, if you can get lower down, on the, or learn up down the road and actually look in the window, you expect to see someone with a big gold chain around their neck and, you know, a few hairs poking out and a shiny shirt, uh, looking frightfully pleased with himself. It's a car that's meant to be aggressive, but it's a kind of BG on wheels. You always imagine the person that drove it looked like Robin or Barry Gibb and had big bouffant hair of the time and a medallion down here and big flared trousers. That's what it was like. It's flamboyant, it's baroque, it's a combination of Liberace and Hugh Hefner. It sums up the 80s and 70s. It's just gross, I'm sorry. Yes, it was one of the first supercars. It turned heads wherever it went, and just looking at it helps revive the 80s. But looking at it, ultimately, is the problem with the Countach. That's why it goes no higher up the list than number 10. Coming up, nine more amazing machines, including the fastest road car in the world, as our search continues for the greatest ever sports car. In our quest for the greatest ever sports cars, the Lamborghini Countach claimed the number 10 spot with its mixture of F1 technology and outrageous Italian design. At number nine, a car so fast, so intimidating, it wasn't allowed on the streets of North America. Skyline for me is a, is a dream car. It's like the heartbeat of Japan. You know, it's the Ferrari of the Orient. The youth market today can look at it and go, that's my dream car. 
It's been described as a PlayStation on wheels. Normal cars tell their drivers about oil temperature and battery power. The Nissan Skyline has its own computer system that tracks and controls everything from G-Force to Turbo Boost to the amount of torque to the front wheels. This car has an engine management system that controls all of the sensors, the injectors, everything. Banned from US roads, the Skyline has become a much better match for the racetrack in North America. The few that are imported usually end up in competitions like this one. It's called drifting. Drifting is uh, basically all about car control. It's sliding the car sideways on a marked course. The Skyline is a good drift car because of its ability to channel enormous power to the rear wheels. The true secret behind the success and popularity of this car is that it can be hacked into or tuned. You can uh, change it according to the RPM. First, the car's computer system is hooked up to a laptop. Next, the factory-installed power and emissions controls are removed. In a way, it, you could consider it hacking. Without any governors, tuners can then boost horsepower and speed through a simple entry in their computer. In theory, you could do it to your own car. The difference with a Skyline is that the engine has so much capacity, it can tolerate increased horsepower without blowing up. You could get a thousand horsepower out of these engines without blowing them up. So it, it, it became the benchmark of all tuner cars. It looks very discreet. It's rather like um, a Japanese 9-to-5 businessman going home on the metro in Tokyo. It's that sort of discreet, and yet it punches this real pow! You know, it's a very powerful, very fast car. Besides all that power, the Skyline also has four-wheel steering and all-wheel drive, huge assets for controlling a sliding car. If your front tires are spinning too much, the car's onboard computer transfers energy to the back. And then when they entered into the touring car series, it was just so successful, they had to put a weight handicap on it. It was just a very, very good car. And what an irritated the shit out of everybody was that it was Japanese. And now they built someone that just looks ordinary, is ordinary, just goes better than anything else the Italians or the Brits could make. I love it. I think it's brilliant. <laughs> It looked fairly benign from the outside, but it was as fast as a Ferrari and actually better behaved through the corners. Going into the first turn, this car is slow. It needs more power at the low end or low RPM to make the drift last. Hacking back into the car's computer system, Steve can effectively alter the characteristics of the engine. It doesn't have much knock, so it's way low. So I'm going to change the timing on it. Rivet. So I gave it a little bit more timing so it would have a little bit more power on the bottom end. Okay. At one stage, that would have required an engine rebuild, but these days, it can be done with a few keystrokes on a laptop. That was enough to give it a little more power. It felt good to her, she noticed it. I could notice it from outside, so we're still in the safe zone on the adjustments. We'll see how the next run goes. I tell you what, I take my hat off to these kids that do it with their computers and things and get these things running sometimes as good as a Formula One car runs. The Japanese had a name for it, uh, which meant the monster. We christened it Godzilla, because this car was uh, so fast, so awesome, so powerful, and the name lived on, and so Godzilla lives. Yes, Godzilla lives, but not everyone's a big fan. I have done a 20-second perfectly controlled drift in a skyline and marvelled at the technical prowess. But there's part of me that does not connect with that car. It's a big heavy lump. Um, it's not particularly good looking. The drifting, uh, it's fun to watch, you know, I'm sure it's fun to do, but it's not my bag. That was awesome. I was like, whoa! I'm like, okay, last run. I'm gonna see. And then I got around a little and it felt so good and then right when, you know, it started feeling good then of course you're like your mind says more power and <laughs> you put more in too much but it was good this nissan earned the nickname godzilla for its power and its use of ultra high technology is revolutionary for sports cars but it filled a niche that appealed only to the true techno head because of that 
The Skyline will have to settle for number nine in our list of greatest ever sports cars. For more than 50 years, this next car has been making dreams come true for sports car lovers all over the US. In automotive terms, the Corvette Stingray is the original American Idol. I still remember pulling the car magazine out of its sleeve and looking at it and saying, holy wow. This car was an exquisite package that came from nowhere and just slapped the hell out of the European competition. At just over 4,000 US, it was a supremely capable two-passenger sports car. Basically as competent as any sports car in the world at a price that most people can still afford. Unlike everything else on the road, this car oozed Americana. I mean, it's got America written all over it, United States written all over it. It's a kind of stars and stripes in automobile form, really. And you can't help but seeing that car and you think everything that's big, blousy, powerful, go ahead, and a bit excessive about the United States, it's represented in that car. It's patriotic, it's blue-blooded, it's American. We will buy this in our droves because it is, it is that. And it offered what America wanted, which was fast, straight-line performance, reasonable reliability at low cost, and a thumping great V8. The earliest vets had the traditional inline six-cylinder engine. Six cylinders lined up in a row and connected to a crankshaft that turned the wheels. With a top speed of 120 miles per hour, it was a popular motor for the time. But the brass at Chevrolet wanted something with more power, something that would earn them respect. To commemorate the 50th anniversary of the V8 showing up in the Corvette, why don't we imagine that these are the cylinders? The question was how to get more cylinders under the hood without radically changing the size and shape of the engine. But how are we going to do it? Because we're tied into a package, to a size, to a weight, to a chassis. We're going to change everything about the car in order to fit two more straight cylinders. The answer was a simple repositioning of the cylinders. So what basically what they were able to do is create a V8 design where they had eight cylinders feeding into the crank, still down the middle, in a better package, a little bit wider, but not long. They could fit wide, they couldn't fit long. More power, same cake. Happy birthday, 50 years, V8 and a Corvette. Great engine, lots of torque, and that's the, that's the American way, because you know it is stop light to stop light here. There's not so many corners, it's not like Europe. Critics claim the chassis wasn't rigid enough to resist flexing at high speed. The result was that its feet, in effect, weren't as well planted on the ground. It's great on that lovely road to uh, Santa Monica, out of LA, Highway 1, you've got the Eagles playing on the 8-track, and it's fine. The slightest curve in the road, the slightest pimple or acclivity in the con contours, and you're all over the place. It's a car that's not really designed to be thrown around tight mountain bends, but it's a car for cruising along one hand on the wheel and the gorgeous girl next to you along, you know, a highway that's forever California and the coast. Now, I, I know, Uncle Sam, it, 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 it's your only sports car, but they drive them with any sort of gusto on anything but a perfectly billiard smooth road and, you know, you'll destroy a small suburb before you stop spinning. There's a crude, rough, just unrefined quality. Europeans would call me a bit crude. And, you know, they would sniff at something that came in and beat their pants off. That's what I say to them. You know, we're all a bit crude in America, but we're, we're crude but effective. How's that? Nobody can accuse the Stingray of refinement. It just doesn't have that. It's really the polar opposite of a European or Japanese sports car. It is muscle-bound, it's aggressive, it's showy, has great fairground qualities to it. It's like a fairground ride on wheels in some ways. Um, but come on, that's, it's just such great fun. I mean, that is the let's get out there and have fun boys car, and that's what it's for. If a Corvette was interviewed by a psychiatrist, the Corvette would tell the psychiatrist where to get off. It would tell the psychiatrist, psychiatrist for wimps. That's the kind of car a Corvette is. No other sports car has captured the American imagination the way the Stingray has. None has lasted so long, but critics are right to point out that it can be hard to control in the corners. That's why the Vet hits the brakes at number eight. At number seven, the car made famous by 007, the Aston Martin DB5. 
Aston Martin DB5 will be forever associated, of course, with James Bond. I mean, it always will be the Goldfinger film. And everyone's imagination, every kid's imagination, the real car, of course, doesn't have an ejector seat, but it's for the guy that thinks themselves probably to be um, a fighter pilot or an airline pilot or, or, a, or a great international spy or a playboy. I mean, it is the Playboy's Express. It's the sort of car where you could jump in, catch the uh, boat train from Dover to Calais, and speed through the night and arrive at a grand hotel somewhere on the Italian Riviera, stirred but not shaken and ready for that first Dom Perignon on the terrace. It is heart-stoppingly gorgeous. It is pretty enough to stop a speeding train. It has a fantastic six-cylinder twin overhead cam engine. It would, in, you know, 1961-62, do 150 miles an hour, which made it great. But much more than that, it had this wonderful, tweedy, British elegance. Aston Martin was one of a number of small, proud English companies known for hand-built craftsmanship. James Bond made Aston Martin glamorous. Of course, Bond was too busy, so instead, we asked Britain's favourite aristocrat to put the car through its paces. He's better known for his Ferrari collection, but Lord Charlie Brockett has never been one to shy away from the camera. We did get a reputation for making cars that were wacky, different, but well built and well, you know, it's huge attention to detail. That's what people liked. Yes, they were hand built and very elegant, but you couldn't always count on them to actually work. Uh, this is what happens in electric, electric windows in old cars. Well, it's going up eventually. Okay, now the red light is on permanently. I have a feeling that we might have lost the fan belt. I didn't see anything on the road behind us. There's another thing, you see, when you switch the wiper off, does it center to, to its next cycle? Oh, no, it goes off precisely when you tell it to go off, which is in the middle of the windscreen. And, it, and stopping them down there becomes an art. No, it's not going to do it. You know why? Oops, it's just done something at me. Because, <laughs> that was wonderful. If you light up a cigarette, you might go bang and explode because the fumes are so great inside the cockpit. Um, always they had um, harsher suspension, like there. Uh, you can feel it. You have to remember, these things don't have brakes. You do have to push quite hard to get uh, any reaction at all. But all of that makes you feel that it's more of an experience. It just requires more effort and concentration to keep the damn thing on the road. Of course, not everyone has a little Bond in them. It's an old man's car. The greatest thing I'd ever achieved was being in the Bond movie. If it wasn't in the Bond movie, it probably wouldn't be remembered that highly. It's a relatively heavy car. It's a luxurious car. Um, but it is the epitome of the grand touring car. It is absolutely, radically not a sports car. A sports car has a singleness of purpose. It is meant to drive. I mean, it should be ultimate driving enjoyment with no compromise. You don't need to bring along your golf clubs or your family. A GT car, a Gran Turismo car, absolutely gives a nod to those creature comforts on the road. It is definitely right up there in the top 10 coolest cars of all time just because of James Bond. But. You know, does it make it a sports car in my book? The DB5 is on our list because it represents the old spirit of craftsmanship that made English sports cars adored worldwide. It's stuck at number seven because some argue it's more a coupe than a sports car. And for that other reason, Britain's cars are famous. They break down. Inspired form and revolutionary function come together in the Mercedes Gullwing SL at number six. It's such a work of art, it really is, you know, it, it's stunning. It's better than any Picasso. The lines of the Gullwing are pretty much perfect. The thing the car has is wonderfully taut shape and yet has rather voluptuous curves, but they're not the voluptuous curves that um, like the Chevy Corvette, which are a bit over the top and brazen and showy. These are curves kept in check and you know that the car's been designed to be super aerodynamic and yet it's hugely glamorous at the same time. Ava Gardner had one, Clark Gable drove one. Um, some favoured the convertibles, but for me the Gullwing with those doors is just so cool. It is the pick of the bunch. 
to arrive in a car and then the doors go up on little gas struts was really quite special. You want to make a stir, in those days you arrive in a Gullwing, you've made it. Certainly the Gullwing is a milestone car, aesthetically, technologically. I mean, it stunned the world when it came out. Everybody just went, holy mackerel, look at the technology they've put in that thing. Its tubular space frame made the Gullwing extra rigid, crucial for control at high speeds. And at only 82 kilograms, the frame was as light as a feather. But those same tubes took up room where the bottom of the doors would go. So instead, they would hinge on the roof and lift up, as opposed to out. It was a practical piece of design, but wound up becoming the car's exotic signature. I mean, those doors were just unbelievable. Literally looked like a bird with the window, with the, the doors open. And when you pull them down, you're in this cocoon. No issue. Getting out is more difficult because you actually got to get your bottom on the ledge back up from the seat and swing out. But um, you see, Mercedes Germans are so clever. I just think of all these things because what happens if the woman is driving wearing a skirt? There's a, there's a bar under the steering wheel. You pull it out and the steering wheel goes up like that. So now you can raise yourself, flip your legs over. See, the Germans think of everything. Damn them. Yet another innovation. This was the first production car in the world to use fuel injection. It was one of the most important high-tech advancements in the history of sports cars, and yet the concept of fuel injection is deceptively simple. With a carburetor, you've got pressure from the fuel tank via a pump, but it's low pressure. And when you put your foot on the accelerator, the fuel falls into the manifold like that, mixes with the air, explosive mix, and the car accelerates. That was fine for normal cars, but again, the Gullwing wanted to use race technology. With fuel injection, it's different because the fuel is actually propelled at high pressure into each cylinder, mixed with the air, and it's the exact amount of fuel. So it's efficient. It is the most combustible fuel-air mix so that you get the biggest explosion and therefore the greatest amount of acceleration and no wastage. It's an engineering-driven car, not a styling-driven car, and the styling comes after the engineering, and it's wrapping up the engineering. It's not that the styling's there not to sell, and the cars, of course, they didn't need to sell many of these cars. They're a rarity, and they have a single purpose, driving hard and fast. While renowned the world over for its glamorous looks and technical achievements, it wasn't always the easiest car to drive. Driving it, it's a truck. You know, it's a big, heavy thing, the brakes, you got to push your, you know, the pedal through the floor to get it to stop. And the uh, exhaust ran right underneath the car, so the floorboard get, gets really, really hot. It'll melt your tennis shoes. And it had its big swing axle in the back, so when you really got hauling butt, you could get it squirrely very easily, so it was sort of like riding the bull. It was unpredictable on the corner, and the suspension wasn't actually very good, which is a pity because the rest of it was brilliant. It's not the nicest engine note. It's not the nicest looking. It's not the nicest interior. But as an overall package, it is one of the greatest. Halfway through our countdown, we've had cars that epitomize style, speed, and groundbreaking technology. Still ahead, the machine that saved the sports car business as we search for the greatest ever sports car. So far in our top 10 greatest ever sports cars, we've had the most outrageous, most glamorous and coolest cars of all time. What could top that? How about a car that literally brings the Formula One experience right to your front door? It's pretty hard to beat a car that can do everything. If you collect Ferraris, you have to have one of these. Ferrari is the ultimate sports car company, and it's the ultimate Ferrari at the minute today. I think I would probably spend a lot of time in the garage just sitting out there just going, yeah. To get to number five on this list, you need something really special. How about this? Everything Ferrari has ever learned about racing cars on a track has been applied to their latest creation for the road, the Enzo, named after Enzo Ferrari himself. They are the quickest at putting a track race technology 
into the road car. So last year's race technology will literally be in next year's road car. No company has a greater singleness of purpose than Ferrari. All of their cars are sports cars. That's all they are. They're two seats and a giant engine. They are only meant to do one thing, and that's drive hard and drive fast. Under the hood, a six liter V12 capable of 660 horsepower, double the Stingray. A top speed of 220 miles per hour is too scary for most drivers to contemplate. Nought to 60 in one, two, 3.6 seconds. For a street car, it's about as close as you can come to a Formula One. Shifting gears with a flick of the fingers, just like in F1, the Enzo only needs 150 milliseconds between shifts to respond. Regular cast iron brakes would melt stopping from high speeds, but the Enzo's carbon ceramic brakes can handle the high temperatures. That's because carbon ceramics don't conduct heat like metal does. 60 to zero in 106 feet. When you buy a Ferrari, you're buying the badge. You know, the prancing horse is, is a great symbol. Um, you're buying the heritage. You're, you're buying the Italian flavor. You know, you're buying into a lifestyle in a way. But buying a Ferrari is, of course, much easier said than done. Money is not the object. It's whether you're part of this exclusive club, whether you're fit to drive an Enzo. That's great. And in terms of marketing, fantastic. A lot of it has been a brand building exercise to now they can comfortably uh, demand an, an, an enormous price premium and they still have people lined up for them. One person who knows firsthand about buying one of these rare supercars is Ray Morangis. They want the people that are true enthusiasts to have it. They, they just don't want somebody who can come up to the dealer and write a check. I wanted the car and I was prepared to do just about anything for it. I had to become part of the, the Ferrari family. I had to prepare a resume of all the cars that I had owned. I had to get letters of recommendation. It was like trying to get accepted into Harvard. At first, I was rejected, and uh, I persisted and through uh, cajoling and politicking and uh, buying lots of lunches and going in and shaking a lot of hands. I was able to um, get on the list. I walked in, and when I saw the car, uh, I just couldn't believe it, that a guy like me could get a car like that. By the way, the car Ray bought cost roughly £300,000. Most of that money goes to F1-style technology, and because of that, the car's looks, at least in some eyes, have suffered. We know in Formula One, aerodynamics don't necessarily make for beautiful shapes. So we've got an automobile in terms of the Enzo that is an incredibly high-performance automobile, uh, brilliantly designed, beautifully engineered, but built around a body that demands raw physics in terms of aerodynamics. So we don't have a particularly, in my opinion, pretty automobile. The Enzo Ferrari is actually very blousy and very vulgar. It looks like a big sort of hairdryer on wheels, and I think it's a great shame in a way, because Ferraris at their best are these lithe, smooth, neat, rather neat machines. Um, this thing is clearly meant to be a, a racing car for the road, a modern racing car for the road, and because of that, it's too wide, too big altogether, and just blatantly vulgar, and you feel like an absolute idiot driving one. Everything on these cars, chassis, suspension, brakes, motor, all of it derived from Formula One. That's what makes it special. But even if you liked its looks and were able to get your hands on one, where would you drive it? The greatest ever asked the state police to shut down part of the interstate just so we could film the Enzo stretching its legs. And not one to miss an opportunity, Ray takes full advantage, pushing his Ferrari to nearly triple the speed limit. But where are you going to do that? Here in America, we're in the wrong place to own one. If you're pushing it on, you'll be over 100 miles an hour too often, and eventually someone will pull out, a dog will pull out, something will happen, and you'll slice it in half on a lamppost. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Rarely out of first on the track, this Ferrari will have to settle for fifth on our list. 
1960s England, the nation is finally breaking out of its post-war austerity. A new generation of hipsters, mods and beatniks are turning heads all over London. At the centre of that swinging scene is a positively groovy sports car, unlike anything that has come before, the E-Type Jaguar. Here was a car that signalled, hey, Britain was at the centre of the hip-hop happening 60s, um, and the E-Type was part of that. The E-Type, to me, it is the most beautiful car in the world. No other car before or since has been so beautifully, beautifully designed. When we buy these cars now, when we wax lyrical over them, when we spend all the money we haven't got rebuilding them, it's because we're trying to recapture that seminal moment of March 1961, when this car changed the way the world thought about sports cars. It was just the most dramatic thing anybody had ever seen. When the E-Type hit the world, it just was a collective gasp. I mean, this car was pure sex. We like to say that if birth control pills hadn't been invented, when the E-Type came out, they would have needed to invent them very quickly. The most phallic of all cars ever produced, the E-Type. It was, you know, it was a, what was they say, a horizontal expression of man's intention or something. The E-Type was one of the first production cars to do 150 miles per hour. It was a direct descendant of a long line of racing jacks that had dominated circuits in the 1950s. The reason why it was special was not only its design and its looks, it had a the classic improved engine that was a, originally in the D-Type, that was a famous racing car, but also it was ridiculously cheap. And this was the democratization of the racing car. Anybody could buy one of these cars. Doesn't mean you didn't have any driving skill. You could just go in, pay your Jaguar dealer 2,000 pounds, and you were driving around lit by your own personal spotlight. Everywhere you went, there was a shaft of gold because you had an E-Type. The E-Type was famous for its unique beauty. Unfortunately, it also had a reputation for falling apart. In many ways, the E-Type was style over content. Rust proofing was not a very advanced science back in those days, and they just literally rust from the inside out. Go to start your car after a week, turn the ignition, the fuel pump wouldn't go tick, 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 so you take a small hammer and just tap the fuel pump and it should have startled it into life. A Jaguar always had a lot of mechanical problems, and back in those days, uh, Lucas Electricals were um, the butt of many jokes, like, why do the British drink warm beer? Answer, because they have Lucas refrigerators. It was a good idea to be really close friends with your mechanic, uh, because you were going to see them a lot. You know, so you might as well put them on the Christmas card list. It overheated. The, uh, there wasn't enough room for your feet. The brakes were heart-stoppingly bad. The headlights, uh, you couldn't see at night. But that's what it's all about, as far as I'm concerned, with a sports car. You couldn't make this car now because of all the product liability, all the lawyers, all the solicitors. They just wouldn't, wouldn't allow you to. Too fast, too dramatic, too dangerous, too wonderful. So we've overtaken everything on the road. We've touched 105 miles an hour. This is a 44-year-old car, and it feels great. It's fantastic. It's still as captivating, still as exciting, still as sexy as it was in 1961. Now do you understand? The E-Type makes our list because it's quite possibly the best looking car ever made. But the fact that it was moody and couldn't always be counted on to show up confines this supermodel to number four. I think this is the best car ever built, certainly the best car of the 20th century. At number three, record-setting McLaren F1. The McLaren F1 is really the field of dreams supercar. It makes it into the bronze medal spots because this is the fastest road car in the world. A car that cost a million dollars. <laughs> the engine is actually encased in gold for heat protection. Basically, the premise behind it is build it and they will buy it. This was a car where basically money was no object. And they just made the car that they thought would be perfect. And what they came up with was a car that will still, at the high end, 
outperform a Formula One car. The car is so much better than you are. You know, it's a bit like having sex with an aerobic instructor. You're never going to wear her out. Do the best you can. And she's going, OK, you done? Are we through now? <sighs> yeah, OK, great. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's how good it is here. Compared to normal cars, the F1 is as light as a feather. That's because it's made with an all-carbon composite body. Combine that with a 627 horsepower engine, and you can go from 0 to 60 in just over 3.2 seconds. Just like the Enzo, this really is a race car, very thinly disguised for the street. Oh, it's wonderful to drive. This is one of the few cars where, oh my god, I'm going 175. Sorry, sorry, excuse me. I mean, it's, it's literally that fast. It is the fastest car in the world. To this day, there's not a Ferrari or a Porsche that can beat it in top speed. A beautiful technical tour de force. And it occupies a very, very special place. It's Mount Olympus as far as cars go. I don't believe any manufacturer will have the money, the wherewithal, or the, the justification to ever do that again. But we'll see. But I don't think so. The research and development is too huge. It can only really be done by uh, a current Formula One uh, or Indy car producer. If there is ever artistry in mechanical engineering and mechanical things, this is it. I mean, there's no silly wing on it. It doesn't look outrageous. It just looks sensual. It isn't like a Countach where 12-year-old boys are salivating over it. I mean, it's a mature expression of, of an engineering design and concept. Still can't find the floor? Well, some of our contributors have. Yes, extremely interesting, but considering the price that's asked, it is accessible to so few people. To me, it's, it's an interesting car, but it's an irrelevant one. It's not a beautiful looking machine. It's a really functional little machine, and it will always be remembered, I think, as an engineering classic rather than a design classic. Why three seats? You know, sitting in the middle, yeah, it's Formula One and all that, but I, it's, I don't want to sit in the middle of a road car. I want to, you know, I want to sit on one side and I want to have the hottest chick I can have sitting on the neck in the seat beside me. I don't want one there and one there because the two of them are going to squabble and distract me. And um, insurance? Well, I don't know. Can you get insurance in cars like that? I shouldn't think so. Um, apart from anything else, it was very difficult to get an order. So, like Ferrari, they had to approve you not you bring them up and say, can I have one? So is it attainable? No. You have to leave it high up on the list. It is a spectacular achievement. And just because people can't get one doesn't make it, you know, any less important. The day I got this car, I drove it home. I drove up my street. I saw another one two doors down. <laughs> so I said, hey, wait a minute. So I, I didn't even know the guy. I just knocked on the door. I said, is that your McLaren? And he goes, yeah. I got one too. And he was visiting this, this woman who lived in the house. And it just, just made me laugh. I thought, well, there's only 64 of these in the world. Wow, this is pretty cool. Ah. Next on our list, the sports car that literally saved the sports car business. Some of the sexiest names on the streets, like Mercedes and BMW, owe a huge debt to the modest little Mazda Miata, the biggest selling two-seat convertible of all time. I think the Miata is the most influential sports car uh, of its time. It actually brought back the idea of having a personal sports car. When we were lost, we had nothing. So cars today, like BMW Z4, Mercedes SLK, all owe their existence to the success of the Mazda Miata. The Miata did for the sports car movement what uh, the British sports cars did in the 50s and early 60s, in that it repopularized the concept of a two-door, two-passenger roadster. There is an example of a sports car that's not a high-performance car out of the box, but it's absolutely perfect. You are down to the ground. It's still under 2,500 pounds. Um, the power to weight ratio is perfect. The balance is perfect. It's an absolute joy to drive. Because it was so light and evenly balanced front to back, the Miata handled superbly. It wasn't expensive. Um, it handled brilliantly was cheap to run, and it performed well. And lastly, and most irritatingly, Japanese again, 
It was reliable. When they tested prototypes, they went out over to Santa Barbara and they were literally being pursued by joggers waving checkbooks and things like this. You know, what is this car? We want to buy it. You know, this is, this is great. Not exactly the most macho of sports car, the Miata is known more for its social clubs than setting speed records. It takes a sluggish seven plus seconds to get from naught to 60. I normally use it for going to the grocery store and back, so I don't usually go over 40 miles an hour. I know every woman has a dream of being able to get on a racetrack and go fast and beat the guys and prove that it's not just a, a, a man's sport, it can also be a woman's sport too. Greatest ever set up a day at the track with a former race car driver to see if Judy could learn to transform her mild-mannered roadster into a genuine racer. Here we go. Okay, we're starting now. First, Judy's instructor puts her Miata through its paces, or at least gets it going over 40. gives people a watered-down version of, of owning a sports car, you know, for, for a limited budget. And it drives better than many much bigger, much more powerful, much more showy sports cars. But it doesn't have oomph. It's a chick car. It's a girl car. You know, I, you know, I see a guy driving that down the highway, and I just feel bad for him. <laughs> <laughs> Would I be seeing you one? Good Lord, no. My friends never speak to me again. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so it's not a high-performance Ferrari, but these cars can touch 130 miles an hour. Of course, the driver has to be willing. Alas, a total transformation was not to be. On this day, the Miata stereotype of being essentially a girl's car held true. Oh, cool. well, that was fun. <laughs> Still, in typical Miata fashion, they had fun. I can't believe they did that. A number of people think that the Miata is a girl's car because it only has a little four-cylinder engine. But I think that's missing the point. A great sports car is not just about the numbers. It's about how it makes you feel when it's, you're driving it along. And it is a man's sports car, not just a woman's car. No, I wouldn't call it a girly car, no. It, I think it's also... I, I would say it's a, it's a unisex car. It's a different feeling, no less a sports car, but just a different, it's, it's a lightness of being. Unbelievable. It was so much fun. I just think the Miata has everything in a car. It just, it can do everything you ask it to do. <sighs> You're kidding, right? <laughs> We've counted down nine amazing automobiles in our top 10 search to find the greatest ever sports car. When we come back, we'll find out which one tops them all. All the cars in our list can boast amazing pedigrees. They represent the very best in engineering and design. But there is one that always seems to silence the critics. It's been hailed as an engineering marvel, a legendary racer, and at the same time, a 24-7 supercar for the masses. At number one, the Porsche 911. I think the greatest sports car of all time probably would be the 911, really, because of its longevity. This car has been around for 40 years in basically the same soulful package. The Porsche 911 is probably the most worthy sports car to put at the top of the list, the greatest sports car of all time. It's a success story in America, it's a success story in Europe, Japan. You know, it has gone around the world and been appreciated in every country. I guess this is where it all started. I guess the, uh, the 911 came out, first production year is 19, what, 64. And this car here uh, is a 69 two liter, short wheelbase. Right up. 40 years ago, Steve McQueen made this car famous in the movie Le Mans. Today, his son Chad takes us on the car for a little drive down memory lane. This car was a car that my dad used in Le Mans in early 1970. They, it came out, uh, and this was actually the, the car that he drove up to the church and, and did all that. And it's all, it's all original. It's got, I just turned 47,000 original miles on the car. To create room for two small back seats, the motor was placed over the rear axle. It was completely revolutionary, 
but it led to a unique problem for the 911. It was known to suffer from something called oversteer. The earlier ones were a pig. I didn't like them at all, because again, you lose your concentration, whatever, get something wrong, hit a bit of damp bit round the corner, God forbid a bit of oil, and you are definitely going the wrong way round the corner. It was a car that was always slightly fundamentally flawed. It never really steered or went round corners as well as it should have done in the early days. The thing about the Porsche, they're tricky to drive fast, uh, especially the vintage ones, the older ones. Uh, they're race cars, I mean, you've got a massive weight in the rear. Say you're, you're going into a right-hand corner. You turn the car in, it's a pendulum effect. You go into a corner and the car wants to rotate. It's the same thing as if, uh, say, you throw a hammer. This is what I'm trying to explain. The head of the hammer is going to always want to hit the ground first because it's the heaviest. So the car does have a natural tendency to want to oversteer. I just love the sound of this motor. It puts a smile on my face. Since the early days, Porsche has worked extensively on controlling the car's tendency to slide. Over the years, the, the wheelbase has extended. Um, of course, wider rims and tire setup. They would push the motor a little further in front of the axle, get a better balance. All they've done is taken that essence of the car with the you know, more than 50% of the weight in the back. It its beautiful, just organic shape and made it a little better and a little better. And sometimes they tweak it a little too far. The next year they come back a little, back a little. It's just a great car. The 911 was also the first production car to have a turbocharged engine. Recycled air from the exhaust is forced back into the cylinders under pressure, where it mixes with the fuel to create a hotter, more explosive reaction. To understand turbocharging, think of what happens to a fire when a big wind comes along. Or if you happen to be near a garage, how about a simple air hose and a gently smoldering cigar? What we're about to do here is basically a real simple version of uh, how a turbocharger works. What we have here is a fuel, and then we have our compressed air. So when you step on the accelerator, say this is your recycled gases, compressed, here's your fuel, and... That's a turbo. Throughout its history, the 911 has been a peerless innovator. At the same time, the car never lost its original spirit. It's just a natural evolution, you know? That car became successful because it deserved its success. It really did. You just touch it and it feels quality. You close the door, it feels quality. You close the boot, it's quality. The seats are quality, the switches are quality. You know, they're very simple inside. And over 40 years, the idea of this strange little car, which in its classic days had a rear engine and a very strange rear engine too, was made to behave perfectly. And so we could all watch as this car developed and got better and better over the years. You don't lose a lineage from this car to this one. I mean, it's still so Porsche, you know? Uh, I guess that's why guys like Seinfeld have <laughs> Hundred of them. From the moment it appeared less than a century ago, no piece of battlefield technology has left its track marks on history like the tank. It has slugged it out in every major conflict of the 20th and 21st century and shows no sign of leaving the ring. But which tanks are the greatest? To find out, we canvassed some of the world's greatest tank experts. They include Tom Clancy, world-class novelist, tank fan and military observer. War is about killing people and breaking things. It ain't the Olympics, it's not supposed to be fair out there. Bruce Dickinson, frontman from rock outfit Iron Maiden and amateur tank driver. Once you've driven 20 yards, you really don't want to stop until you get to Berlin. And billionaire tank collector, Jacques Littlefield. I have about 220 vehicles, of which uh, 65 or so are actual tanks. 
And from the sharp end of the tank business, we have War Vets. It was very similar to just getting out in the dirt and having a nice time. And the War Torn. Oh, this is love. The tank is about love. Now sit back and brace yourselves. The top 10 greatest ever tanks and the technology that makes them mighty. We all know what a tank looks like. It looks like a Sherman. We all know what a tank does. It does what a Sherman does. The number 10 greatest ever tank is the 33-ton fantasy tank that we recognize from newsreels, comic books, and Hollywood movies. I would definitely be someone who'd say, I think the Sherman tank is one of the greatest tanks ever made. The M4 Sherman is the tank that won the Second World War for the Allies. In total, nearly 50,000 Shermans were built, and the greatest ever reunited one of the survivors with three veterans for whom the Sherman became their wartime home. Because during the Allied campaign in Normandy, when these men were still teenagers, they trusted their lives to Sherman's state-of-the-art technology. I haven't been one of these for 60 years, but I'm willing to have a go. I'm Brian Carpenter. I was a driver on a Sherman tank. I'm Nobby Clark, and I was a gunner. My name is Ken Tout. I commanded one of these Sherman tanks. Making its debut in the Western Desert Campaign, 1942, the American M4 Sherman soon became the ubiquitous Allied tank. The Brits have them, the Canadians have them, the French have them, the Russians have them, the Chinese have them, and it manages to perform everywhere. We were impressed by the size of it, by the efficiency of it. The guns operated beautifully. Excellent, yeah. The gun in particular, 75 millimeter. Very much more accurate, and a larger shell, which meant that we could shoot at bigger animals. Had to have a good gun, had to have good armor but its main key was mobility. It had to be able to get fast into the enemy rear and exploit that breakthrough. It was so fast and so easy to drive, and it's a, a lovely ride, almost as good as being in a, a modern motor car. It's no surprise the Shermans drove like a car. They were built by the mighty US motor industry. The Sherman tank design was driven from the beginning by its producibility. The Allies thought that uh, we were going to have to outproduce the Axis, so they were built by places like Baldwin Locomotive Works, by General Motors, by Pacific Car and Foundry. They were produced in vast quantities. For every sort of contemporary German tank, the Americans were delivering about 10 Shermans. The Sherman design was really a universal tank that was intended to be used by a largely citizen army. It needed to be operated by somebody who knew how to run a farm tractor, by somebody who could drive a truck. And you couldn't have got any greener than Brian Carpenter, a college student, before he became a tank driver. And I've got the two uh, steering levers between my knees, and I've got a, a clutch pedal and an accelerator pedal, and, of course, the steering levers act as the brake. Standardization is the key. It's only really in the engine that these tanks differ. This one, and others like it, had a nine-cylinder air-cooled radial, actually an aircraft engine. I didn't think an aero-type engine was perhaps all that suitable for a slow-moving vehicle like a tank. But, of course, everything was low-geared, and at, at full revs in bottom gear, it would only do two miles an hour. And in top gear, fifth gear, it would do 22 miles an hour. But you needed to be on a, a nice, smooth, level road a bit downhill, otherwise it wouldn't take it. The Sherman tank offered some unexpected domestic facilities when the lads were out and about. We didn't have any laundry, so you had to wash your own clothes. And the only way you could dry your clothes was that you have a, an exhaust at the back, which you switch the engine on and you can dry <laughs> your laundry very quickly. And while you waited for your socks to dry, how about a cup of tea? You could put a kettle on the, the top of the exhaust and boil the kettle. Once you've finished your tea and nature calls, the Sherman supplied an unorthodox portable toilet. Empty shell cases. The toilet arrangements, this is where the empty cases come in, you see. <laughs> if you had an empty case, <laughs> this is reused, then you could get rid of it. And best of all, if you were caught short, it was easy to resupply. 
And there were times when there were no empty cases, so they pointed the gun in the direction of Germany <laughs> and got an empty case. Nice one, Nobby. But the Sherman was much more than an exercise in improvisation. Everything about the tank's design was carefully considered. The American philosophy was to use the tank as an infantry attack weapon. So the armor is suitable for a vehicle which is highly mobile. It's got to keep the enemy on the move, but isn't necessarily slogging it out with other tanks. But tank-on-tank -tank action was an operational fact of life. And by the time modestly armored Sherman arrived in Europe in late 42, it found itself on the receiving end from a new generation of German tank killers. And German tank commanders soon got the measure of the Sherman. I saw them first time when I came to the Western Front. There were no metros. The very thin armor, easy to hit the armor, to penetrate the armor. This tank, uh, a thousand meters, the, 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 the shot went straight through from both sides. Bad news for Sherman, but that's only the half of it. Of course, you had 140 gallons of petrol in the tanks so full. And of course, you were penetrated, the petrol went up. That's where they got their name from the Germans as Tommy Cookers, yeah. because they brewed up so easily. But despite all its flaws, in the end, it was the Sherman's original design considerations that proved decisive. If we look at the Second World War with hindsight, it's quite obvious that the tank you can mass produce is going to win the war for whichever side. When we encountered Germans, uh, they didn't come alone. They come, many of them, and then we didn't have a chance. Oh, brilliant. I never thought I'd do it again. <laughs> Just as noisy, yes. Because <laughs> I'm older, it, it's all seemed much harder, like stiffer. But the feel of it was really good. It all sort of came back. Uh, Congratulations. Well done. <laughs> it's the art of compromise that makes or breaks a tank, and all the remaining nine greatest ever have made some tough decisions. Next up is the designer tank that leapt straight from the drawing board into the jungles of Southeast Asia. The Sheridan tank was built to satisfy the wish for an air-liftable tank, a go-anywhere light tank for the weekend. Number nine. The dream of tank designers for decades has been to develop a tank that's lightweight, easy to transport, but has the firepower of a main battle tank. This vehicle was unique in that it had a more firepower than any other vehicle that you can think of that would be dropped from an airplane. The transport aircraft flies over the ground at maybe about 100 miles an hour, 10, 20 feet off the ground. The drogue chute comes out, pulls the tank out, it falls to the ground. It's a frightening thing to watch. This machine you're going to drop into a distant part of the world to fight, let's call it a colonial war. And in the context of 1970s America, that can mean only one place, Vietnam. I was part of a cavalry unit. We were kind of search and destroy, go out there and don't come back. Who better to give us the lowdown on the Sheridan than two guys who experienced Vietnam from inside the multi-talented tank? First impression was very positive. It did a lot of neat things. It could be airdropped. It floated. All you could see through the window was water and fish. The animal M551 Sheridan, my connection, driver. Tricycle steering, four forward speeds, two reverse. The manual said 43 miles an hour, but yeah, I think it could get more closer to 45, 46. If you hit the rice paddy dikes just right, you could actually get it to float and you could hear it slap when it hit the ground. The sensational cross-country performance of Sheridan was down to one thing, armor anorexia. Every aspect of the tank is calorie controlled. As soon as you start talking weight that's light enough to be dropped out of an airplane, you're talking about a tank that's gonna to have to be around 10 tons or 15 tons. And it's very difficult to do that with uh, conventional steel armor. The only way Sheridan was going to stay in one piece was if it was made out of aluminium. For a given level of armor protection, you could get a much better structure that is something able to withstand the rigors of airdrop. And the requirement for heavy firepower on such a skinny frame led to the Sheridan's most striking feature. It has an amazing looking gun, 152 caliber gun that fires missiles. It would follow an infrared beam, probably similar to a laser beam today. But it left the gun tube and you swear it almost hit the ground and it would fishtail all over the place, but it never missed the target. 
The same fat barrel was used to fire conventional rounds too. Pretty exciting in ultra lightweight Sheridan. This weighed 17 tons. When you fired it, all hell broke loose. Lift the whole front end of the tank right off the ground. Hopefully you had a helmet on sometimes because your head would be knocked around inside the turret. I mean, it really was a kick. But the bouncy recoil created more than a headache. If you fired the conventional round, the recoil would knock out or knock out of alignment the electrical systems that would fire the missiles. As well as a ruptured missile system, another potential problem was the aluminium armor didn't offer much protection against, well, anything, and the Sheridan was stuffed with ammunition. The driver's surrounded by ammunition on both sides. Then you have them stacked on the floor, L28 rounds. No smoking in the driver's hole, please. No smoking in the tank, actually. Try to keep any sparks away from the ammunition, or you'd lose your home. It's kind of the Swiss Army knife of combat vehicles. That is, it could do everything kind of OK, but nothing really very well. One of the things they tried to do with the Sheridan was to look at opposite design requirements. You needed mobility, but you had to have it air droppable. It had to be able to swim. It had to be able to, to fire a missile. So it really does a, a very good job of putting all these things together. Granted, they're all compromises, but you end up with a vehicle that does have capabilities that was unlike anything else available at the time. To qualify for the list of greatest ever tanks, imagination counts for something, but it's performance that rocks out. And the Sheridan couldn't put its metal where its mouth was. Our next battle tank could not be accused of such underachievement. From the outset of World War II, Germany demonstrated ruthless tactical superiority and engineering excellence in its tank warfare. The Nazis created an armored force to which the Allies had no answer and made it their business to stay one step ahead. In 1943, German tank technology found its ultimate expression in the Panther, eighth greatest ever tank. This is the last remaining operational Panther in the world, and the greatest ever brought this Panther veteran face to face with the big cat he commanded over 60 years ago. This thing is from outside in perfect shape. It couldn't be any better. You know, I could hear it and smell it again, you know. That's, yeah, that's exciting, very exciting. The Panther was a big shock for the US Army and for the British Army. It's an upsurge or evolution in tank design compared to everything that it preceded it. The single most important feature on the Panther was its firepower. It had a superb gun. The long 75 millimeter gun that the Panther introduced was probably the best all around tank gun of World War II. Okay, move! The Panther gun was purpose designed as an anti tank weapon. It achieved its power not by going to a larger caliber, but by going to a longer barrel and a larger powder charge. The gun itself, it's a very long barrel and uh... The size of the barrel is important because the longer the, the, the shot is in the barrel, uh, the higher the speed, the higher the muzzle velocity. Like every other Panther commander, Wolfgang Stirner was impressed by the awesome power of the gun. You can destroy with this tank an enemy tank broadside at 2,000 meters without any problem. Any tank. It has an excellent cross-country mobility. Excellent. This suspension we had, if you go over a bump, you see how the road wheels are going up and down, you know? And that inside you have a relatively smooth ride. Other things, your brain comes off, you know, if you go fast. Keeping Wolfgang's brains in order was down to the Panther's running gear. This is the Panther suspension. What we see here is uh, eight road wheel stations. The innovation on this tank was to have large rolling, uh, road wheels for low rolling resistance, but uh, interleave them so that they could be placed close enough together to e evenly distribute the weight. So as we go down here, what we see is alternating pairs of two together, too far apart, two together, too far apart. The Panther's original design came as a result of Germany's experiences on the Eastern Front. In 1941, German tank tactics fell apart when they encountered a new breed of Russian tank, which they were horrified to discover was much better than their own. Shamelessly, the German response to their new foe was to copy it, and the first thing they nicked was its sloping armor. 
this type of tank is the first tank we had in Germany with a sloped uh, armor. This, this armor has a, a size of about 80 millimeters, but due to the slope, it has a protection ability of 100 millimeters. Because if, if you get a front hit, it bounces off. Not satisfied to merely copy the Soviet tank, the Panther design aimed to improve on it. As we look at the front of the tank, you may notice this rough appearance. This is not shoddy workmanship. What this is, is a pretty sophisticated piece of countermine technology. It was a paste that was troweled on, purposely troweled rough. It was then hardened with a blowtorch, and its purpose was to provide standoff from magnetically attached mines. The improvements didn't stop with the armor. The Germans took pride in giving the tank a complete engineering makeover. Whereas a mechanism in a Russian tank might weigh 100 pounds to do a particular job, the Germans could take that 100 pounds and get it down to maybe 70 pounds. Here you have the casting for the engine block for the Panther. And as you can see here from looking at it, this is an incredibly intricate casting. It's got lots of thin sections. It's been very carefully engineered so that I would say a comparable Russian or American unit to this would be heavier and larger. It might be somewhat more rugged, but this is designed so it's right there on the edge, just very beautifully built and designed. They would do things in a manner that was better, but sometimes was very complex. So the command comes now, Panzer Marsch! Go! The complicated Panther saw its first action at the Battle of Kursk, the biggest and meanest tank battle of World War II. But from the off, things started to go wrong. Most tanks broke down before seeing any action. They were not ready for combat. They were much too early to brought to the front. It was not a very impressive situation at first. The problem with the complex engineering was not only that it was prone to failure, it also wasted precious time and resources. These are the main bearings for the Maybach V12 engine that powered the Panther. They're a beautiful piece of engineering. They're designed to last for years. The problem was the Panther lasted weeks or months in combat, and it's one of the reasons that the Germans lost the war. They just couldn't back off from engineering excellence in every aspect of their weapons. The German national character seeks too greatly after perfection, when perfection is not only not needed, but it's counterproductive. It's said that if Germany hadn't gone overboard with the engineering and built simpler tanks in larger numbers, the war could have had a different result. Still one nil, but to the other side. So whichever way you look at it, this tank rightly deserves its ranking at number eight. Overtaking the stationary Panther is a machine that if it didn't exist, we'd have to make it up. If Satan produced a tank, it would be the T-72, seventh greatest ever tank. The 70s was when the gulf between Soviet and Western ideologies seemed to be at its widest. And the symbol of Rusky threat was the T-72 tank. The T-72 is a tank that was built by the Soviets to fight World War III. The T-72 was designed to form the spearhead of a Soviet push into Western Europe. The ultimate attack tank. The T-72 was definitely something to be worried about. It had thick armor, good mobility, a big gun, and a very low profile. It's about a foot lower than a British tank and about 18 inches lower than the contemporary American tank. So it's a difficult target to hit, especially if it's coming at you fast in great numbers, fully tracks up with infantry behind it. Oh, well, that sounds pretty exciting. You look at the 272, it's wide, it's squat, it's got a big gun. And when you're driving it, you actually feel aggressive. It, it just wants to get up and go. You feel part of the tank, and it's fun to drive. The biggest surprise that we had with the T-72 actually was its gun, which was a 125-millimeter caliber gun. And that would have caused us big problems. The Soviet barrel was five millimeters wider than Western barrels, and that meant bigger shells and more armor penetration. But the revolutionary bit was that the gun was fed shells by an automatic loading system. The big green lump is the back of the gun, which is also coupled to an autoloader. Right. The ammunition comes up through these two flaps in the floor, which is lifted up to about here. Rammer comes out of the back of the turret, pushes the warhead in. With having an autoloader, you don't need the loader. 
which means you can reduce the size of the tank. You can make the tank smaller, which is a harder target to hit. Removing a crew member immediately reduced the weight of the tank by about 12 tonnes, the weight of the armour needed to protect a crewman. This increased the tank's speed and manoeuvrability. But the T-72 went further, shrinking the interior so that even the remaining crew had to be specially selected. If you're taller than 5'6", about here, my wife's taller than that, you can't fit inside a T-72. It's munchkin land, all right? The T-72 seemed to fit perfectly into the Western stereotype of the Soviet tank, a brutal, efficient killing machine. But was T-72 really all it was cracked up to be? Intelligence officers are scared for a living. The intelligence officer looks at the piece of Soviet hardware and goes, oh my god, the Russians have finally figured it out. That's the deadliest thing on the battlefield. We're screwed if we have to go against it. Then we get hold of it. We find it's a death trap like everything else the Russians ever built. For starters, there's the trusty autoloader. It has an unfortunate habit of trying to stuff the gun into the gun. It wouldn't be unknown for the crew members to lose their arms with the autoloader picking up the sleeves and trying to ram that in the gun run the shell. But there's much worse. T-72 has its ammunition exposed, and it means that very often, if it's struck with the right sort of incoming round, the whole tank will blow up. The death machine, death for its own crew. The likelihood that the crews of the T-72 feared the tank almost as much as the Pentagon did has got to count against it in the great scheme of things. T-72 makes it to number seven. While mutually assured destruction was making everyone miserable on both sides of the Iron Curtain, the loved-up Swedes tried to find a way to reform the image of the tank as an instrument of peace. The unique S-Tank comes in as the sixth greatest ever tank, the pacifist choice. When the tank world first saw the S-Tank, they collectively shook their heads in disbelief. I think S-Tank astounded everyone. It is so unlike the conventional tank, that it was bound to have people's chins dropping for a while when they got to terms with it. The S-Tank is one of the goofier ideas that's come down the pike in the past 50 years. It caused us to rethink what is a tank and what is the essence of a tank. From its turretless snout to its protective fence, twin engines and built-in swimming skirt, the S-Tank is quite simply unique. And its audacity surprised even the Swedes. Well, I was shocked when I first saw it because I haven't seen that kind of tank before. I was the first soldier in the Swedish army on the S-Tank in 62. The greatest ever went to Sweden to find out what all the fuss was about. If we look at Sweden, it's a neutral country and it's caught between the Warsaw Pact on one hand and NATO on the other. So it needs a posture of robust defense so that no one's going to invade it. I think S-Tank is designed for an attack by Russia swinging north about and down through Sweden. To even the most casual observer, the S-Tank has one particularly striking feature, no turret. It was intended to fight in forested terrain. Narrow forest roads don't lend themselves to a fully turreted design. There's perhaps not even room to swing the gun around. So the first thing the Swedes said was, perhaps I don't even need a turret. The absence of a turret makes the S-Tank just over seven feet tall. Very handy if your main tactic is concealment. An S-Tank had this ability to literally dig itself a hole. All you'd see sticking over the top is the gun barrel, hardly anything more. It was designed to shoot and scoot. Under onslaught from large numbers of enemy tanks, you can take a few out. You can then roar off in the opposite direction dig yourself in again. In battle conditions, the S-Tank would be buttoned up, all the crew protected inside the tank. But when the greatest ever were in town, posing no obvious threat, everyone could stand up and have a good look around. Extra eyes for the driver. It's very easy to drive, and even fun. Well, if you're driving on a road, say about 50, 55 kilometers per hour, you can turn around 180 degrees in less than a second if you're good enough. But it's more like the inside of a fighter aircraft than anything else, in that you're literally using the controls on a stem, everything right at the edge of your fingertips. 
One of the S-Tank's most astonishing concepts is the reverse driver. It's his job to drive the tank in reverse after it's taken a pop at a Russian tank column. You want to keep the gun and the armor still able to engage the enemy. You didn't want to turn the tank around. A solution, therefore, was a rear-facing third crew member. But he had a duplicate set of driving controls which faced to the rear. The tank could, in fact, drive as rapidly and as easily backward as it could forward. But the jewel in the crown of the S-Tank is its unapologetic main weapon, the fixed gun. Well, the whole problem with the fixed gun is that you've got to manipulate the whole tank to fire. You had to be able to aim the whole hull in the same way a fighter pilot aims his whole aircraft. The design breakthrough was a controllable hydropneumatic suspension. The Swedish innovation was to be able to control these in such a way and in such precision that they could be used as a gun aiming device. To tilt the gun, the first and fourth pairs of road wheels move relative to the other wheels. Because the length of the track is fixed, it means that the tank has to tilt up and down. What you can see here is the, the arm that the first road wheel is connected with. And that one moves when you move the hull. The elegant and sophisticated S-Tank was fated by the world's military. They loved it, but nobody bought it. It was intended to fight a Russian army on Swedish terrain using Swedish army tactics. It was so well tailored to, uh, to that mission that, in fact, it wasn't a very good fit for anybody else in the world. In particular, there was one insurmountable problem. The disadvantage of the tank is that you have to stand still when you're firing. Because the hydraulics are shared by the suspension and the aiming system, the gun cannot be fired while the tank is moving, making it less versatile than other tanks. The S-Tank was doomed to sixth place. To get into the top five greatest ever tanks, you can't just sit around on your borders. You've got to be prepared to go and kick ass. You've got to expose yourself. And for that sort of thing, you can't beat the British. Our first five favorite tanks were expecting trouble on a grand scale. But if your intentions are more modest, which tank offers the best value for money? Centurion, fifth greatest ever. First seeing action in the closing days of World War II, the Centurion is the longest serving main battle tank in the world, a favorite of cut price armies in low budget wars. From the early 50s, right through to the turn of this century, you'd find Centurion in a battle somewhere. It was the best tank in the world for a good 15 years. Colonel John Gilman has spent his entire career at the heart of British tank development, and the Centurion was his first love. Well, when I joined my regiment way back in 1968, my first vehicle was a Mark 62 Centurion, very like this vehicle here. And we drove it for three and a half thousand miles, which is an awful long way. And Colonel Gilman knows better than anyone that the key to success for any tank is battlefield maintenance. The crew can keep this vehicle in the field fighting. The whole vehicle was designed from the crew point of view around two spanners. One was the quarter five, teeny weeny spanner, and one was for the track adjusting nut on the front. And between those two, there aren't any other spanners virtually you need. Centurion's common sense approach extended to a unique method for hitting the target. The ranging machine gun is absolutely ingenious. It's linked to the main gun. So it means that a gunner simply has to fire three rounds of tracer from the machine gun. And when one of them strikes, the target is picked up at once by the main gun and you get a first round hit. It's a very easy tank to get into and turn the engine on. It's just like a car, but then the nightmare begins. If you think back 60 years to motor cars, this is a crash gearbox, so you have to match the revs absolutely and double the clutch going up and down at the same time. Despite Colonel Gilman's 30 years of experience with the intricacies of the crash gearbox, the Centurion still puts up a fight. It's like learning to ride a bicycle backwards.
The Centurion may be a bit of a handful, but it's the fuel economy that really hurts. You're talking, going across country, at least five gallons a mile. Five gallons a mile. It gives you, across country, about a 40-mile range before you start getting worried and have to refuel. You don't have to have everything great on the tank, but if it goes fast, it's manoeuvrable, it can blow up other tanks and not be blown up itself, that's a pretty good tank. If you're in combat in this vehicle, you're highly likely to survive. You're going to win. In a world that seems to crave bells and whistles, the Centurion remains true to its principles. Keep it simple, stupid. With the handling characteristics of a mule and a range of only 45 miles on a tank of fuel, Centurion makes it to only number five. In 1970, finding itself without a friend in the world and surrounded by irate neighbours, the Israeli Defence Force decided to create a tank of its own. At number four, Merkava, the DIY tank. From the mountains of the Golan Heights to the urbanised Gaza Strip, Israel faces a unique set of defensive demands. The Merkava is a very successful vehicle because it does two things. It can fight in close urban combat, but it can also do the traditional job of a tank and fight in open country on the Golan Heights. The Merkava is a creature of Israel. Usually when you design tank, you have to compromise between firepower, protection, and maneuverability. In our case, protection, the survivability, is the most important thing. Survivability is a big issue for a country with a population smaller than London's and a conscript army made up of both men and women. My name's Eleanor Krishnan. I'm a tank instructor here in the School of Armed Forces. I teach soldiers how to be drivers, actually. This is my favorite part of the tank, the power unit. The engine and the transmission together in the front of the tank. That's why the tank is called the Merkava, which means in Hebrew, chariot. Just like horses were in the front of the chariot, they were the power unit of the chariot. So is the engine and the transmission a power unit of the tank. Now, if a shell hits the tank, it would hit the power unit and not the people that work in the tank. The driver that sits over here is moved to the side. I don't want to sit in the middle, right in the front where a shell can hit me. I'd rather sit on the side. See perfectly well where I'm going without having shells hitting me. I have the whole desert for myself when I'm driving tanks. It's an amazing feeling. I mean, you can go so fast and it's just a monster. It's this powerful monster. One of the things that makes the Merkava so unusual is that it's in a continuous state of evolution, reacting to the unique requirements of the Israeli army. According to our experience, there are a lot of small innovations in order to make the tank and the suspension suitable for area, like the Golan Heights especially, the area is very rocky. The unique spiral spring suspension on the Merkava has increased its efficiency by allowing the springs to separate completely from the running gear when it goes over a particularly big bump. The arm of the rolled wheel is not connected to the spring. When it goes down, it disconnects goes by gravity down. The tank free falls back onto the suspension arm. This increased travel makes for a much more pleasant ride. The suspension is also taking part in, in protecting the vehicle. As, and as you can see, it covers most of the side of the tank. The tank was developed virtually in a combat situation. This is quite exceptional. All those lessons that are learned on the battlefield are streaming in while the thing's being designed. Well, another thing is these chains. They're called Sarot Shulamit, which means in Hebrew, the hairs of Shulamit, which is a girl's name. The most vulnerable point in the tank is where the turret and the hull meet. So what these chains do is that if a shell hits them, they just change the whole course of the shell so that a shell won't hit in the most vulnerable point of the tank, because a tank without a turret or a hull, it's not worth a lot much. And with the engine at the front, there's space in the back for some friends. Another thing that I'm really excited about is the fact that you have loads of room now in the tank. 
You can have parties in this thing now. You can have the whole unit go into the tank, move around, have some drinks, have something to eat. It's a lot of fun and it helps a lot because now that you have room, you can operate much better. It can carry a section of infantry in the back. That makes it unique amongst tanks and that you've got an armoured personnel carrier and a tank rolled into one. Now, I don't know of another tank that's that versatile. So why isn't everybody driving mercs across the deserts and high streets of the world's trouble spots? You've got to bear in mind it's designed for use in Israel, and you don't have to worry about the need for airlift capability. It is a big, heavy vehicle. Ideal for Israel, yes, but for an expeditionary force, too big, too heavy. Some people would beg to differ. This is the best tank in the world. Nothing will stop this tank from driving. If it wants to go on, it will go on. And if it finds a target, uh, I don't want to be there in that target instead of you. I won't argue with that. Our number three greatest ever tank didn't just go back to the drawing board. T-34 invented it. This is 100% the best tank in World War II. It was just one of those breakthroughs in weapons design that happens only once a generation. The T-34 is the tank that won the Great Patriotic War for the Soviet Union. It incorporates innovation, but with the lowest common denominator. So you get a rough and ready design that you can mass produce. The whole essence of the Russian military philosophy was that if you were a peasant from the fields, you should just be able to jump in it and just get on with it and, and drive it. As you can see, you know, I'm only one step removed from a peasant. Oh, no! The greatest ever put the reputation of the T-34 to the test by giving rock star Bruce Dickinson a ride in his very own Iron Maiden. What I love about tanks is the fact that it was an individual combat. It's almost like a fighter pilot, except it's on the ground. And also the way in which different tanks and gunnery systems evolved to counter the advances in technology, that's what I found attractive about tanks. The star qualities of the T-34 tank begin with its characteristic shape. T-34 invented sloping armor, which in turn affected other parts of the design. Well, one of the real innovations in the T-34 was the weapon. This thing uses a 76-millimeter gun at a time when most other tanks had much smaller guns. They thought, we have to have a weapon that's strong enough to defeat a tank that's armored as well as our own T-34. So they basically designed the gun to be as efficient as the armor. A very thick cast turret, very simple construction. It's sand molded, and you can still see the mold marks on it. And, and it's wartime, why make it look pretty? If it works, use it and start killing people with it. The T-34's extraordinary qualities were put under pressure when Germany tried to push eastwards in 1941. In the long and bloody confrontation on the Eastern Front, T-34 became recognized as the premier tank of its day. T-34 was the best tank at that time. He was the ideal compromise of uh, armor protection, firepower, and uh, cross-country maneuverability. That was the best tank, period. Uh, all other tanks were far behind that. Powering this vehicle is a V-12 diesel, old diesel airship engine from the First World War. Six cylinders on the left, six on the right, and a fuel injection pump in between. Very simple, very lightweight, and very easy to maintain. These were manufactured basically from the 1920s right up until the present day. The T-34 may have been a great weapon, but it was a horrible tank to serve in. When you have a big 450 horsepower engine immediately behind you bolted straight to the floor, all that vibration gets passed through the metal, up your legs. It's very unpleasant inside of it. I'd say, so far, of all the, all the tracked-type vehicles I've ever driven, this one is the most fun and the filthiest, which is the same thing, really. <laughs> T-34 transformed Russia from a peasant economy to a superpower. A tank capable of that deserves some respect. T-34, third greatest ever tank.
The penultimate greatest ever tank has so many bells and whistles that no tank in its right mind would pick a fight with it. The Abrams has to go looking for trouble. Number two. The tank is big, it's very well protected, it's extremely fast and has a darn good gun. It's just a stunning piece of technology. It's scary to think how much better it is than tanks were one generation ago. A single Abrams can take on one or more of any other tank on the battlefield and still win. The M1 Abrams, you have a Rolls Royce of modern tanks that's seen the Americans through several wars. I was hit in the side, the front, and the rear. Right in this particular area right here is where I was shot. We went downtown Baghdad knowing that we could be shot at from above. We were being fired at by heavy machine guns and uh, rock pell grenades. I mean, rock pell grenades are designed to destroy vehicles. Rocket propelled grenades are tremendously destructive weapons, able to burn through up to 30 inches of steel armor. But the Abrams tank is covered with a new generation of laminate armor, lightweight, and more than capable of dealing with an RPG. Its top secret composition saved Lieutenant Montgomery's life. The first hit actually took a hit right in this area. It exploded, took out my 50 caliber machine gun, as well as all the ammunition that I had stowed here. This is where I was standing. The hatch was actually down in what we call open protect. And that's when he fired. The tank did exactly what it was supposed to do, absorb the impact. Yeah, it was a good shot, but it was the last thing he ever did. Uh, the tank from behind me shot him. But the Abrams is much more than an armored shell. The M1 is designed to be user friendly and enemy averse. It's got a fire control system that I call I wish he was dead. Theoretically, in less than five minutes, an M1A2 Abrams can kill off an entire battalion of its enemy. Keeping the 68-ton Abrams moving is a 1,500-horsepower jet engine. Take the governor off the engine. The M1 tank will go over 70 miles an hour. Once you get on it, it'll take a couple seconds for it to kick in. But once it does, it feels like, I mean, there's nothing that's going to stop you until you put the foot on the brake. The use of an aircraft jet engine has been a source of controversy ever since the Abrams first visited a gas station. The M1A1 has approximately 504 gallons on a full tank, and it gets about a half a gallon for every mile. It takes approximately eight gallons to start the engine, which is quite a bit. I just think it's absolutely barking mad putting a, a gas turbine engine on a tank. It's the most incredibly thirsty engine on the planet. I mean, you need an oil refinery following the darn thing up the road to Basra. Fuel economy aside, the jet engine also creates a superheated exhaust. This, of course, you've got a great big jet efflux going out the back like a little blowtorch. Well, you know, you're going to get yourself a, a heat-seeking missile straight up your jacksie. Not very nice. Despite such quibbles, the fact remains that Abrams is a heavyweight message that tank warfare is alive and kicking in the 21st century. 2003 will be the last time anybody even thinks about tangling with the United States military in a set-piece battle. Hmm. Watch this space. From 10 down to number two, we've seen them spit and bite. We've seen them swim and snarl. We've even seen a tank fly. But now, time to reveal the tank that ranks number one in the greatest ever after the break. Nine came close, but when it comes to the greatest ever tank, there can be only one. Germany had been banned from making tanks after World War II. They just hadn't played nice with the ones they'd had. But by the 1970s, a new Germany was allowed back into the tank shed, and the technological excellence that created the Panther spawned a new generation of big cat. Leopard, the greatest ever tank. It's an excellent machine. You compare it with other tanks, and you'll see that it's smaller, lighter, and faster. I think it's the best combination of firepower and mobility on the planet at the moment. The perfect tank, it's got to be mobile, it's got to be armor protected, it's got to have firepower. Leo 2 does all those in spades. It's an excellent tank. Maybe German engineering, but the Leopard 2 is a statement of 
European identity. It is a combination of the best firepower, the best protection and the best mobility in the world today. Leopard 2 must be a contender for one of the greatest tanks ever. Not just a contender, Leopard is the greatest ever tank. And here in Sweden, 280 Leopards prowl the countryside. After the demise of the S-Tank, Sweden abandoned making its own tank and went shopping for a replacement. The German Leopard knocked the spots off the competition. But would you let your 18-year-old kid take it out of the garage? And my name's Johnson. I'm the driver. I'm the commander. My name is uh, Christian Janssen. My name's Chaz Kelly. I'm the uh, gunner. My name is Josef Rosen, and I'm uh, the loader of this tank. I'm also the chef. The greatest ever joined these Swedish army conscripts as they began an 11-day combat exercise, getting to know the Leopard's world-class technology. Six months ago, they left home for military service. And probably they had never been breathing. They've swapped the family Volvo for 62 tons of killing machine. And it's the Leopard's world-beating user-friendliness that lets these youths tear up the tundra with confidence. No steering levers or crash gearboxes here. It's almost like uh, driving a car, but it's a bit uh, heavier. Today, we are going to drive like uh, maniacs. The steering wheel looks like a car steering wheel. The seat here, uh, very comfortable to sit in. A uh, sports car type of seat uh, produced by Recaro. Very simple uh, compartment, looks quite much as a car. A big white pedal in the middle, that's the brake. You can stop 62 and a half tons, about nine meters. We are gonna drive the tank to its uh, bitter end. I will make them feel confidence with this tank. The attitude is to get them to be hunters, to feel the tank. The extraordinary performance of the Leopard is enhanced by its radical modular design. It's actually an enormous kit of parts, all easily replaceable. And just like your Mercedes, when something goes wrong, you don't reach for your wrench, you grab your laptop. For my maintenance, I have a laptop. I connect it to the separate modules and I can test them individually. So what I'm going to do now is to plug in this cable to the central logistics and then I plug it into the maintenance computer and I can see what's wrong with the tank. And then I change that module. So you could say that this computer is like the normal test computer on a modern car. But for instance, if you should have a problem with the power unit, you take the whole unit out, you take the unit to the workshop, you get a new unit instead, put that in, the tank is ready. And the rest... Uh, the Leopard's the engine is, is another world-beating factor. Nothing new or fangled, just massive and reliable. This engine is a uh, quite common industrial engine and a marine engine as well. The engine has about 1,500 horsepower, a V12 engine, uh, 48 litres, and 15 times more uh, torque than a normal car. If you're worried that treating the Leopard like a giant skateboard is going to bust the tank, fear not. The Leopard is one of the few tanks in the world that comes with a manufacturer's guarantee. As long as the factory supervise your maintenance, then you're OK for a good 14,000 kilometers, which in tank terms is an awful long way. To help stop the conscripts from running into each other, the Swedes use a state-of-the-art tank command control system. It's an elaborate version of the system taxi firms use to check on their drivers. And I just move around this map. Of course, I can center the map on my own tank or on somebody else's tank. That's no problem at all. And they can also broadcast anything they want in text or uh, icons. It's innovations like this that keep the Leopard one step ahead of the pack. Because by keeping most information on the screens and off the normal radio system, they can keep radio conversation focused on the important things. Almost 100% of the radio talk now is about the enemy, as it should be. I just need to find the enemy and go kill him. That's fighting talk. The greatest ever decided it was time to put the world-beating performance of the Leopard to the test against the local champion, a Volvo, over a treacherous 400-metre slalom course. Oh, no! 
With the greatest ever tank, it's not only about winning, it's about destruction. So there you have it, the top 10 greatest ever tanks, each with its own unique character, but sharing the same grim intention. From the moment they first stumbled across no man's land, the Iron Cavalry created mechanized warfare in its own image. The tank has become the face of war. Be afraid, be very afraid.